And I am with Mauler and the drinker Getting trashed with the web screen dinkers A cheap night cause I'm feeling kinda thrifty Got a ten pack of beers and a bottle of whiskey Hop up the cork, have a glass of wine hey. That's the old say Trouble walking in a straight line But for me a Pinot Noir It's open bar With our host Mauler and the critical drinker Woo! We're here. Whoa. All right. Cheers, everybody. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of rolled the the wrong intro for a few seconds <laughs> just before I it started. It went, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> this is like wait it's a so minute. <laughs> what can I say? I've had, I've had a couple of these already. You know. That's the equivalent of stumbling through the saloon doors at this point. They don't have those anymore, do they? It's terrible. No, it's such Gosh. a shame. I just. I want to. I want to like kick them open and just be, yeah. <laughs> look at look around. Everyone kind of stops. The conversation stops, and they just go beer. You got to uh, bring them back. Bring them yeah. back in style. So it's yeah. I suppose it's more applicable in like a dusty western town or something. You know, it doesn't work so well where it's in Scotland and it's probably raining and drafty and cold. So saloon doors. Fifty second anniversary so. though. It is. Yeah, know, can yeah. you believe we've been doing this for fifty two years now? It's just it's just <laughs> flying by. Yeah. I'm still feeling super young, so that's good. Thank you. Right, yeah. You don't look your age, so what can no, I say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, we've got uh, some guests here. We should bring them in so we can get cracking with this scintillating banter that we, we do here in the open bar. Um, or I can just pass out in a corner while everyone else talks. It's easy. Work. Either way. <laughs> yeah, either way. way, it's fine. Well, you know him uh, as the the man who shouts a lot on on YouTube, and that narrows it down. <laughs> mm, I know he what is, you're talking about. He is the one and only Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers. Hello, hey, hello. Uh, Fifty two years going strong. Party like it's one nine nine. I see all of my lovely one nine nine crew in the chat, and uh, yes, I shout a lot. Uh, a great description of literally everyone that's ever been on Friday Night Tights. So you didn't know who it was going to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> but when, yeah, happy started, to be here. Yeah, no, thank you, man. Uh, when we started like the fiftieth open bar, and it was like I tried to introduce someone by saying uh, yeah. oh, this person rants a lot on YouTube. It's like mm, I think that really... was me. That you, yeah. and then you were like, and then and then you had to introduce Gary. And you're like, this next person rants a lot, and then you had to in introduce Az. You're like, this next person rants. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> we we all rant a lot. So yeah, happy to be here, guys. And uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about the wonderful achievement uh, known as uh, the Little Mermaid. Uh, one Absolutely. of the worst films I've ever seen. It's so bad. <laughs> it's so terribly bad, and I can't wait. We will get right into it, uh, but we'll bring in some of the rest of our guests. Uh, so we've got one who's uh, who's <clears throat> on another live stream at the moment, but he will be with us shortly. But uh, we also have the despot of Antrim, these, uh, the fighting pride of Ireland at the moment, uh, and he has absolutely annihilated so many of these movies that we have critiqued uh, over the past few years. This guy is full-on savage with it. Uh, hello, sir. It's great to have you back on, man. Thanks very much for having me on. Glad to be here. Yeah, <laughs> it's good to have you. And, uh, well, um, man, I, I, I was watching some of your stuff just recently, right? And I watched the one about, um, like, body positivity and advertising. <laughs> I think it was a little kicked off by that Dove soap advert. And, yeah. man, you were brutal. But you were really insightful as well. Like, just how they... It's how really they interesting. Manipulate people. Because I wanted to do a video and try to detach myself from it emotionally and not rant and rave and go crazy and just thought well let's take a look at this from a purely analytical perspective like as propagandists how do they make something that is so hideous look <laughs> try how do they try to make it look good in front of a camera and it's really interesting they use a lot of light they use uh glare and flashes and shadow and mm. they use they, the really interesting thing is the psychological and the subliminal techniques that they use to try to kind of con the audience into agreeing with it and they've had a little bit of success with it. But the interesting thing about it is that when they're doing these body positive ads, their their core message is that beauty is very, very subjective and that any woman can be beautiful. Not any man, like, you know, forget about men, but any woman mm -hmm. can be beautiful, right? Because yeah. it's all women. It's really weird. That's the other thing. You never see any man in these ads. It's 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 like this weird twisted wonderland wor world where only women exist. Um, and they don't have any need of anything else. It's really weird when you yeah. think about it. But... Uh, very fascinating, yeah. Very interesting. Some of the comments on that video were brutal. Like, I had a lot of obese people commenting that um, 
you know, they're depressed and they feel terrible. And it's like, oh, man, when you talk about the diseases that fat people have, you don't even know. And they were listing some of the things that went wrong with them. It's I really felt for some of the people that were commenting. Like, it's uh, it's brutal. Yeah. But what body positivity is terrible. It's like advertising smoking. I really mm-hmm. hate it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just I, I think my favorite theory of yours was the whole hot by association thing, where it's like you, <clears throat> you get like a couple of like really beautiful yeah. models and then put the fatty in between them, and it's like you somehow like subliminally you're meant to just associate all three because if they've got like the same makeup and the same clothes and stuff, it's like always, all the same. Next time you see a like if you go into Premark or because a lot of these British ad companies do it, like Premark, Tesco will do it, uh, Lululemon in America. Next time you see one of their ads, pay attention. You'll often have a hot girl. Like she'll never be in the middle. She's usually on like the left or the right, but she's in there. And if you look at the hot girl and the, you know, the not quite as attractive lady, <laughs> about it, um, you'll okay, notice yeah. generally have exactly the same her makeup and clothes. And it's to create a subliminal association between the two, so that people think. Uh, so it's not a conscious association. It's it's advertising, so it's all subliminal and subconscious, but very interesting what they do mm, no very much uh but well well it's, uh, we've we've got many things that we have to discuss here today uh one of which is as you all know the little mermaid came out recently uh it's been out for almost a week now and uh the box office makes for some interesting reading so <clears throat> based on what i've got here from box office mojo uh the total um box office that it's sitting at right now is 209 million after about a week of uh, release, uh, $130 million domestic, which is not bad. You know, it's, it's not terrible after like almost a week. Um, not great, but uh, the international, which is normally on par, if not more, than. It's the- usually a lot more on these Disney live action remakes. Like The Lion King made $1 billion uh, internationally, uh, about $600 million domestic so it made 1.6 billion it made it sound like it did great but in reality it i mean it did do great obviously but that's the international was insane for and again i hated the lion king the live action live action lion king um so yeah these international numbers are usually pretty high for these remakes yeah right now it's sitting at 78 million uh, which is uh, that's rough man that's uh it's just over half of the domestic total so it kind of seems like the whole rest of the world is is uh, no interested. Re- yeah, I kind of rejected this movie. Um, hey, Drinker, makes... some some people in chat are saying your volume is pretty low for them. I don't know. Usually, that doesn't happen in streamyards for the host, but just a lot of people have said it. So I don't know. If yeah, it's... well, uh, I'm uh, I've changed it now. I don't know how I'm coming okay. through. I can boost it uh, more actually if I'm still too low. Okay. Uh, chat can tell me. Am I might. Yeah. Am I too low, or do I need to? Um... <laughs> They need to bump it up a bit. Either the chat's trying to help or they're trolling, and I walked right into it. Yeah, Either it way, be, it'll be entertaining. So, <laughs> well, I suppose you guys will be able to tell me as well if you can hear me okay. Yeah. You've been pretty okay for us on yeah. our end. So, all right, let me uh, let me put it up a little bit and okay. see what happens. So, all right, a lot of them are saying it's good now. So, right, I'll put up a bit good. more so look I can that, I can try and look at look at that picture for the test spot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's up for consideration for an emmy as well that scene i just think that's fantastic i'm actually going to be nominating lizzo for an award for that uh i should i think we should yeah um <laughs> but yeah i will get back to the little mermaid um just as before we go on so yeah so the current uh worldwide box office is sitting at 209 million uh, 130 million domestic and 78 million international and uh that's that's not looking good. Um, no. I guess currently this movie is shaping up to be a bit of a flop because the budget I think was two hundred fifty million. Well, that's what I've seen for it. Uh, in which case you're going to be looking at uh, what seven hundred million, six at seven hundred million, at to, least seven hundred million. Because they've yeah. been marketing this thing really hard. Like, what was the first advertisement came out last summer? Was it? They pushed, yeah, I think it was last summer, and they did. They pushed this movie really, really hard, especially after all of the backlash that they were dealing with and the legendary uh, dislike ratios that it was facing. Um, but yeah, the marketing, if you took it, from what I understand, the budget was around 250 on this movie. Um, yep. And then you add the marketing, you add all the other stuff. This movie needs to make between six and seven hundred million dollars just to break even. That's not a good place for almost any film to be anyway. Um, but 
this film, yeah, uh, this is a failure. If it doesn't hit a billion dollars, essentially, it's not like you're just making a movie like this of this scale to just make a little bit of money. You're actually wanting to make a significant profit and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So even if it does barely break even or uh, makes, you know, 20, 30, 50 million dollars, that's not a success. That's a failure for a film on this scale. It just is. And there's no way to spin it for them. Well, I think part of the allure for Disney, anyway, of doing these live action remakes is that they've always been huge money makers for them. I think they've they've yeah. all pretty much been in the billion dollar club. Um, things like Aladdin made crazy money. Made uh, billions. It's inexplicable stuff like that. It's just like, oh, I guess it's on name recognition history. There's a lot of people who are just like, oh, it's Aladdin, of course. Cause... I guess, like, you know, we, we talked about this last week, I think, on Open Bar, where it's like... Uh, parents and stuff will just use them as like daycare for a couple of hours and so they're not too particular about what they take their kids to see um and so yeah they can get away with stuff like this because it's like they get a little bit of member berries from like their own childhood and their kid gets to watch bright colors and stuff on screen for a couple of hours so yep. there's something in it where it's like you don't have to be too um you don't have too high a bar set for you but uh, it feels like with this one oof, the people are just not taken to it at all like well, I mean, it's international audience. Uh, international audiences are widely rejecting this film, and a lot of the international audiences don't buy into a lot of the identity politics and a lot of the stuff that that Disney's been pushing recently. And this film was we we've never seen backlash for a movie prior to it releasing than than we did with this. And this even got more hate than Rings of Power prior to Ring uh, prior to Rings of Power coming out. I it's mean, been, we're talking what three three million downvotes. That's insane. It's been That's faster really in a bit. Those live action ones. We've had we've had some memes. Go, like the, remember the Mulan Cruella era? That was like, yep. I think when everyone really started to notice. Like, wait, what the fuck are they doing with those things? And it's like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, none. Of, uh, I've talked about. Uh, like, I haven't seen all of the live action movies. I, I I'd never watched Aladdin, um, Maleficent. I don't think I saw that one. Um, I wouldn't have seen this one. Uh, but then Gary had to go bully me in my in my <laughs> chat. So then I asked my chat. For the second time, because the first time I asked him and they voted no, don't go see it. And then the second time Gary was in my chat and he's, uh, you know, flexing his subs and his popularity and suddenly the chat votes, yes, I have to go see it. I'm like, really, guys, you're doing this to me. So um, so I, I saw this one for Friday Night Tights. But the only one that I've really enjoyed, honestly, was like the Cinderella uh, live action movie. That one was really good. But that was a I long time it, ago. It was good. It's really yeah. good. It's excellent. It, it, it's because um, uh, it was Emma's. No, oh, sorry, no. That's I'm thinking of Cruella. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, know yeah I didn't see Cruella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't see, but but like Cinderella came out years. It was, it was before a lot of the the identity politics stuff started to take over everything that Disney was doing. So it was kind of prior to all of that. But even like I the the Lion King up until the Little Mermaid of the ones I'd seen, the Lion King was the worst up to this point. Now the Little Mermaid has taken that crown. It is awful. Uh, the, the characters, the supporting characters, uh, like they were so depressing to watch and annoying to watch, especially Scuttle. And don't get me started on the rap. We've all heard it. It's oh, the worst man. thing we've ever heard. Oh, God. You, you could legit, like you could use that in Guantanamo Bay to like con extract confessions from terrorists and stuff. <laughs> it's like, awful. It, it is, is awful. genuinely <laughs> Like, right, like said it's before, like having it's, your ears raped. It's awful. quite <laughs> terrible it. stuff. When I heard I, it, I was like, there's no way this is real. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like what, kind of like our reaction to the Game of Thrones season eight. Yeah, uh, Mahler. That's shit. exactly right. Me and Mahler said, "There's no way these are real. There's no way." And they were real. Somebody, like, yeah, I, I was, I was looking at some of the top comments on the video uh, that Disney uploaded for that uh, rap, and one of the top comments said, "This song is amazing. I set it as my alarm every morning, and I wake up an <laughs> hour early to turn it off to make sure I never hear it." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, that is so good. It was one that was like, "This song is fire on mute." Yeah. <laughs> That's it's actually quite amazing the effect that song has on you. It's incredibly visceral. When I was on the cinema, and that thing was blasting out of the speakers, like I physically tensed up and was digging my fingers into the chair. It's like involuntarily, it's unbelievably hideous. It's the worst thing I've ever heard in the cinema. I'm not exaggerating. Not I mean, it's histrionic like, for a dramatic effect. It it's shockingly terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're pairing up Aquafina, a person who has a very distinct voice at the best of times, with a really horrible, obnoxious rap song. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> like, why would you think that's a good idea? 
on top of the lifeless animation that they created for the character in the film. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it was a perfect storm. And yeah, like you said, when most of the, like, you know, there's a lot of hyperbole on the internet. Sometimes we, you know, we oversell a point or whatever. We're not overselling when we say this no, is the worst thing I've it. ever heard. Like, it's so bad. It, it's one of those things like you have, it's like kind of like the matrix. You have to see it to really understand it <laughs> yeah um, um you if, if you're listening to this and you have not heard this aquafina seagull rap song words <laughs> cannot describe just how god awful it is you really just have to hear it for yourself we're, we're not going to play it here because one no. we might get done for copyright and two it would be considered a war crime and so That's i don't want to get prosecuted for that hey uh, i played it on tuesday night's main event and i lost subs so i'll never do that again yeah. <laughs> so. uh, just before we keep going here we've got disparu joining us hey man how was the dnd stream oh it's, it's always good but every week um nice. Did the you best hear us talking about Aquafina's song and they had to show up? Is that what it was? I, I joined on the line, it's ear rape. Immediately knew what you're talking about. I, I, no, that, that was a great topic. And also, I, I went through stuff at double time speed to kind of remind myself of things before this stream. And you watch that on two t on two x speed, it's worse. I don't know how it manages it, Whips. but you'd think getting it over and done with would be a lot better. No, no. For some reason, just it's it's more horrific. The best thing is they know it's horrific because it ends mm -hmm. that scene with her throwing a blanket over him to shut him up. It's like, why? Are you, and, and she like covers it with the um, pillows and everything. Why are you making a song where even the main character of your own show doesn't like it? This is meant to be entertainment. This is, yeah. Oh God, there's there's so much about this movie. I, I think one of my biggest issues with it, like forgetting about the casting and stuff like that, it's just bloated and boring and really long-winded and... Um, just not enjoyable to watch. the The original movie, and this blew me blows me away even now. It was eighty two minutes long, eighty two minutes the animated movie, and the amount of plot that they managed to cram into such a short amount of time is really impressive. You got like a complete character arc, a complete well developed story with a satisfying ending. This one is like a hundred and fifty three minutes or something like that. It's like. Uh, way over but it's almost an hour more sorry i think 135 minutes apologies um but yeah it's it's almost an hour longer but it adds nothing in terms of character development or story or anything everything just takes so much longer than the original mm -hmm. That's a lost art by the way just modern filmmaking it takes so much fucking longer to say less yep yeah really annoying yeah. And it makes no sense because they spend all of this time with the strategic plannings of how can we do this? How can we, you know, make more money? How can we get more people? And you make a film like this that was unnecessarily, you know, so much longer than it needed to be when, you know, if it would have, I mean, that wouldn't have saved the movie by any means if it would have been 88 minutes long. But it just kind of, it's one of the pieces to the puzzle that shows you how out of touch they are with the entire movie making process nowadays. I, it's it's I, like, I, know your audience. Like, you've got an audience of children who are probably going to be under 10. Like, what do, what do kids at that age not like? Really fucking long movies. Because they're not yes. going to sit still long enough. They're not going to sit still for, like, two and two hours and 20 minutes or something. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's yep. way more than they can do. And so, yeah, just um, keep it short. Like, the original did. They understood how to make animated movies for kids back in the day that would just grab their attention, give them, like, a nice satisfying story and then get them out the door for the next showing do you think that this was made for kids though or do you think it was made for the the, the women who were kids at the time that have now grown up and have different life experiences because it was made for activists about. on twitter really well exactly <laughs> like I, i've seen people that didn't see the original movie and i didn't watch the original movie for this um but i went back and compared some of the scenes and the changes that they made are very specific to and they all change like the values and the meaning of the different characters and they're so sp it's like sensitivity readers just went through and wiped everything out but even sort of it's like some of the plot doesn't make sense with the changes that they made like if you remove the love story then it doesn't really make sense why she's upset that a statue gets destroyed uh in the original movie it's because it's the person she loves being destroyed which matters but even from that when you get down to something basic like um he destroys her cave full of objects in the original movie he really cares about it it's like how can this, if, if this is the price I have to pay to teach you this lesson, I'm willing to pay. So it was sort of, I know that this is going to make you hate me, and as a father, I know it's going to hurt you, and as a father, I don't like that. But it, it's kind of for your own good, and this is all I've got left to me now. Whereas in the new movie, he, he just flips. He, he snaps, he just does it in a rage. Um, and you see in the original one when he leaves, it hurts him. Well, like, she starts crying and it hurts him. 
Um, and he doesn't like what he's done, so he kind of leaves in shame, but he still thinks he did the right thing. Whereas in this, he leaves in, range, in rage, and she only cries after he's gone. So it changes the father figure from this guy who's willing to sacrifice his own, like, what his daughter thinks of him for the best thing for her, to just essentially an abusive dad. And, well, remember, and that's like, throughout in the, the entire of, movie. In the minds of modern writers, though, men are just emotionally volatile balls of anger who can't control themselves and don't make any good mm. decisions and everything mm -hmm. they do is wrong, essentially. So, of course, that's how he's going to act. He's going to lose his cool and destroy everything and then storm out. And she has to. She'll put on the brave front in front of him until he's gone, and then she can show a bit of emotion. Um, it, it to go back to that point that you made though about changing things for the modern audience, um, but then losing the meaning of the original movie. Um, the the climax of the animated movie had Prince Eric saving the day. He's the one who like steers the ship into Ursula and kills her, which is great because it proves to Ariel's father that humans are not all bad. You know, right. they, they have redeeming qualities. They can be heroic. Um, and they can be willing to risk their lives for, for um, you know, people like the mermaids and stuff. And uh, that's a, an important part of his character development. It's him realizing that this guy is worthy of, of his daughter's love. Whereas in the new one, no, we can't have that. Nope. We can't have a man save the day. Of course we fucking can't. Ariel has to do it for herself and she has to save herself. So what the fuck does Eric do? He's not proven anything. He's not he's not proven anything on behalf of humans. But they've the writers have lost that larger meaning because all they cared about was we got to have our hero moment for the the female protagonist. She's got to save herself. Of course she fucking does because it's Disney. It's every fucking movie that they make now has to follow the same exact formula. It's and it's, that would, this is how you lose storytelling for all for I hear ideology. Would, all I all I hear right now is you saying modern audiences. That's all I <laughs> That's, hear right now. <laughs> this movie is just tailor-made for modern audiences. <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> but that was That's through the entire is. movie. Like, when he, he gives her the reins, she, she's never been in a carriage before, doesn't know what one is. So for some reason, he gives her the reins. She immediately goes, oh, I'm, I love this, I'm going really fast, I'm about to kill people. If you get run over by a carriage, you die. And he goes to reach it. And he'd go take them back and take control. And it's like, no, no. And he's just scared in the corner while she's the one enjoying it as she's like putting everyone else's life in danger. Like, of course all the he's way scared. Through. Of course he can't take any control. Of course he doesn't have any agency because he's not allowed to. Yeah, Again, he goes to and he's like, oh, like... I better not actually. The, the only, the only th part of his character that I worked out throughout the entire movie is that I'm part of the royal family who wants to fix this island. But at the same time, I don't want any of my duties or to do any of my work. I just want to piss off into the ocean. It's like, well, you're a horrible person. I don't think the king should want her to marry him if that's the only personality trait you've got. <laughs> that was the, the update for a modern audience at the end as well. Obviously, in the original, they get married and then presumably they head off and have kids and all that. But in, in this one, it's just nowhere. They, they don't get married. You never see them get married or anything. They're just together on the beach at the end and they head off to the boats. And the inference is that they're going off to find trading partners for the island to make the island prosperous. And I thought that was such a perfect analogy because it's the rejection of family in pursuit of career and money, which is just feminism 101. So, you know, women can't get married and have babies anymore. That's bad. But, you know, grinding out your existence to go out, go off and make money for the man. Yeah, that's that's good. That was an interesting line he did. It's like, where have you been? I've been going out to other cultures so we don't let, get left behind. It it essentially mm. said there's something wrong with this island and we need to go out there and, and like everyone else is better than us. It's like, I, okay, it's very weird. There was lots I, I of things quite, like that I for the entire movie. I never quite understood this island either because it's like, they, it seems to be vaguely European in terms of like their technology, like the, the way they dress and stuff, like the way they mm. conduct themselves, the accents and things. Um... But then, like, the queen of the island is black, and, like, her prime minister is is played by a, a Pakistani actor, I believe. It's uh, is it Art Malik. Um, so it's, like, this weird, like, multicultural utopia. But, like, how? It's set in, like, the, the 18th century. How does any the other of this come about? The other thing is, the obviously, the inference is, well, there's so many black people on this island because it's the Caribbean. And people, black people were brought over to the Caribbean as slaves. So I'm thinking, hold on, does that mean that Ariel is black because she was also brought over to Caribbean waters? Like, her ancestors were brought over as a slave, and now she is the, the, the progeny of that? 
I mean, nope. I can understand why the humans in the Caribbean are, are black, but why the mermaids? Sure, the, the mermaids would be Native Americans or something. When well, you well, think of like, the, eth the ethnography, it makes no sense whatsoever. And it then they also you know have the this. <laughs> they've got a, a, a their political system is um despite the fact that the island's elite they're all black their political system is it's a royal dynasty and they all have english accents so presumably they had a revolution and then following the revolution they decided that they were going to set up a feudal system <laughs> when when you try to think back of, in terms of the world building the history and the ethnography it it, it uh it doesn't make any sense. Well, like how well, you, uh, like you know. it literally uh, the thought process got no further than the writer just going like, "Well, I'm looking out my window, right, and I see a whole bunch of like you know different ethnicities and cultures walking by. <laughs> of course, the world's always been like that throughout history, so I'm just going to write it like that." They don't <laughs> care about what, believability. Um, Sorry, go what, ahead, Muller. With what accents they've got, what um what people are there and stuff, you start to infer like what had to have happened historically in order for those people to end up there. And you start inferring maybe like additional new atrocities or some kind of trait. <laughs> and then I can yeah. just totally see the rise be like, no, 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 it just doesn't make sense. Shut up. It, it just when doesn't the make prince, sense. You don't need to like, when the prince is traveling that. abroad, he's just like bringing people back with him. That's what he means. Like like a slave caravan. <laughs> yeah. back, let, like me ask you, let me ask you this guys this question. Is there anything good about this movie you can say? I can't find anything good to say about this movie. Yeah, I guess if you want to reach, you can say she has a good singing voice. And my argument to that oh, was so fuck, does Dan Vask. To it. So so does Dan Vask. So let's make him the fucking Little Mermaid because he'd be better than her. Uh, but I mean, it, it's there's nothing good about it. I don't think she's good in the movie. I think she's a bad. I'm not saying she's a bad actress. I'm saying she's bad in this role. The CG was bad. The supporting ca characters were bad. Nothing was good about this movie. I, if I, I had think to say one good, good thing about things it. In it. I would say Melissa McCarthy was pretty good, and oh, that God. that shocked me to my That's core right, yeah. because, like, I genuinely find her like more irritating than fucking flossing with barbed wire. But like, um, yeah, she was reasonably good in this. She seemed like she was having fun, and she wasn't doing her usual screechy voice thing that she normally does. So yeah. Yeah, I thought she was okay. Wow, yeah, there That's were good. there was one more good thing. So the, the best thing, obviously, was Melissa McCarthy. Who was she played a good pantomime villain with Ursula, and the second good thing, which I thought was terrific. Uh, when Ursula becomes the young hot temptress, that girl looks almost identical to a young Amber Heard, and I thought that is perfect. That, that's that's just that like, <laughs> couldn't do it better because the job is to entice this young naive man into a relationship that's going to destroy him. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh, my God, Disney are so based, like making that girl look like Amber Heard. <laughs> it's like hiding, hiding the brilliant. monster, the monster within. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, I was really angry watching this movie all the way through because um, I, I really like. I mean, I went. It, there's been movies over the past couple of years that I liked when I went into them thinking I was going to hate or I wasn't really interested, but to watch it so we could talk about it on Friday. Well, there were several whatever. women in this one. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was uh, over from the kick. A, a suspicious amount of women. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so this, this, I was, I was checked out pretty quickly. Um, and you know, just kind of like checking, you know, my phone and like, yes, in the theater, I didn't care. I was that checked out. Uh, it was just bad. And so, um, I, I looked at it and I was thinking about it from everybody else's perspective. And I'm going, I don't know how this film holds the attention of the target audience, which should be children. I don't know how this film holds their attention considering it looked like Zack Snyder's little mermaid is what it looked like. Yeah. Um, and I, that's not something that children are going, they, they like bright colors and they like whimsical characters and, you know, they like funny things that are relatable. And there was none of that in this movie at all. Um, it was all these muted colors. And, and um, so it's not surprising that it's not doing well at yeah. all. The, um, cause you know, I mentioned this in my review where like you've got things like Sebastian the Crab, like he's so expressive and and just such a fun character in the original movie, um, because they didn't have to worry about making him um, lifelike and and anthropomorphized and photorealistic. Now he's literally just a crab, and like he's he's got no personality, he's got nothing to him because like you can't give that kind of expressiveness to an animal like that, especially a a fucking crustacean. You know, and they had the same problem with the Lion King, where like you've got photorealistic lions. Okay, well they can't, they can't smile, they can't emote in the same <laughs> way that a human does, and so you don't have that connection to them in the same way you did with the animated movies. Yeah, uh, and so yeah, like 
th this movie didn't really make me angry. I was just bored watching it. Like, I was just really, like, counting down the minutes until the thing was over because it's so long and so tedious and so... Like you say, it's like Zack Snyder's version of... Um, of uh, Little Mermaid, it's so mm -hmm. washed out and like dreary and just bleh, everything's Depressing. longer than it needs yep. to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the only time I found myself caring about one of the characters is when Sebastian, the, like the first, she's just got her legs and Sebastian gets put in the cage. I'm like, well, okay, he's going to get sold to the chef, which obviously is a song they cut out. And he just appears on a window. I'm like, well, how did he escape? I wanted to see the story of Sebastian <laughs> escaping, getting cooked. And instead, he just teleports up there. Yeah. People, oh, people teleport in this movie all the time, but you can be on a shipwreck miles away. You just teleport onto the, onto the land. And everyone's like, oh, he's got here. How close are these two kingdoms? Because it, it felt like they were just a swimming pool away, the way they were traveling between them all. He got, he got in a little rowing boat. The next thing, he's over the, the like this massive battle. It, it's like... <laughs> I, I love oh. how redundant the dialogue as well. Like the the bit where Sebastian like tracks Ariel down to her grotto after she's had an argument with her father, and she's like, "How did you find me?" It's like you fucking come here all the time. All the this time, is your hideout. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you think he found you? It's not like a secret hiding place. Like you know, like, we know you. We know this. Yeah, man. Uh, it's so if you uh, go back to the original point of what you were bringing up about the box office, um, it, it, the international side, it appears, and I saw a couple of uh, articles talking about it. This is this is definitely an anomaly for like Disney live action, where the domestic box office looks to overperform the international box office, and that speaks volumes about how this movie's playing, uh, and that's going to be a problem for them. It's going to be a big problem for them, and I'm interested how the spin will go from the, the mainstream talking heads when this movie ultimately either doesn't make money or slightly makes profit, and they're not going to discuss making a, another version of it. So, but I, was, um, I, go ahead. I, I think that makes sense, though, because these changes are done from like a Californian cultural perspective to a movie that went out worldwide and everybody liked worldwide. So to me, it yeah. makes sense that the rest of the world is like, why are you doing all this? I like the original stuff. And to, right. like from their perspective, like we're fixing it. But to everyone else, it's like, well, I like that over there. And so yeah. none of the changes make sense. And all of the changes that you're doing go in one direction. And even if you don't really notice them, it, it ruins the character. It like removes the soul from the entire thing. And you're just left with something that feels really cold and um, doesn't have any of the appeal the original did. Yeah, they even made Ariel Blue for the China poster to make them think it was, I guess, Avatar, a spinoff yeah. Avatar movie, and that didn't work. Uh, China still rejected it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, uh, surprise, surprise. China <laughs> did you see the numbers for China? Did you see the numbers for China? Unbelievably low. Like two I, did, mil I, I think I read $2 million yeah, weekend. It was like had a, catastrophically low for China. And that's after they put made her blue. Like, hey, this because... is the Avatar spinoff, China. You liked Avatar, <laughs> The Way of Water? Here's a spinoff. Look at this well, blue the, person. The thing is, didn't didn't Fast X um, play quite well in China? And yes. that's, that's still got that's a pretty not diverse possible. cast. That's not possible because the Chinese audience are racist, as the Western media has recently reminded us. <laughs> the the, the quote is incredible. The, like the Guardian published an article yesterday saying IMDb had to had to change their rating system because of online trolls and, uh, yes. and yes. review bombing. Like the Guardian are now running cover for it. The media, it, the cope is wonderful because they know this thing is probably going to flop overall, especially when you look at the competition that's coming in the next three weeks. So they're already running cover. And I do enjoy the cope, but at the same time, it is disgusting because they're essentially accusing the Chinese box office and, and, and the Far East of being racist. When they're yep. not, They, like you said, they enjoyed Fast X. They just don't want to watch the 18th garbage remake with, uh, you know, Race Swap Little Mermaid. Yeah, but well, fa yeah, fa so fast. The F Fast X is doing pretty much the complete opposite of what the Little Mermaid is doing. Where internationally it's making huge numbers, but domestically it's not really doing it well. It's doing fine, but the domestically, what did the last one make? Like a hundred and. 50 160 something i don't know a million domestically overseas these movies play very very well um and so that's what we're seeing with fast x i haven't seen a fast and furious since seven i'm a big fan of the franchise um but since paul walker passed i haven't watched them i will just haven't gotten around to it um i i like the fact that they're just getting dumber and dumber and dumber yeah. um and again i'm ready to see vin diesel on a t-rex in space uh do know. it yeah do I, it i, I, I they, need they, to see it they, they've kind of embraced 
yeah, the meme. I guess they know what they are, and they're they're just happy to cater to their audience. And there's something kind of commendable about that. Like they don't have any high minded ideals that they're going to change the world or they're going to bring about social progress or whatever. It's like, what what is our audience like? They like fast cars, loads of like technology and weapons, uh, big muscly guys, and and hot women. Yeah, there's a winning formula. It's it's not fucking rocket science, man. Just give the <laughs> yeah. audience what they want. And like, there's the the with the Fast and the Furious movies, you always get those montages where they want to set the scene. It's like we're in Cuba or now we're in like Rio de Janeiro or whatever, and you'll just get like a montage of like cars, palm trees, sunset, women in bikini, like women's ass. Doesn't matter why. It's just there, and it's like they they put that stuff in because they know it. People enjoy it, and yep. it's great because. It, most other movies just won't do that anymore. It's like everything especially, is... Just... Yeah. Especially if it's cinema release. Yeah. It's yeah. like everything in most other films has to be sterile and sexless and just uh, got to avoid the male gaze, you God, know? That's, that, so that is, uh, that's Lucasfilm in a nutshell now, just sterile and sexless. It's so <laughs> weird. It's like Star Wars now exists in a completely asexual universe where men and uh-huh. women are no longer attracted to each other. <laughs> <laughs> unless unless Finn's saying you got boyfriend, got cute boyfriend, got cute boyfriend. Oh my god, that was such a oh, cringe yeah. line. That was such a cringe non-Star Wars line when he said that. You got boyfriend, got cute boyfriend. What? What are you talking about? I just uh, I think John Boyega just died a little bit inside yeah. with every scene that he had to do. <laughs> yeah. there. He, yeah. he knows what's up. He's not he's not an idiot. Like, well, hey, but we he had to do it. Kylo Ray hot kiss at the end, huh, guys? Mm. That's exactly what you were after. Yeah. Good lord, man. Yeah, Star Wars so, is a whole different ball game. We can just no, geez, let's not go there. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, yeah, let's avoid. Yeah, we can get sucked into that. We're one. talking about it's Disney's dead. other failures. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so many. So, there, there was something I wanted to ask. Have you, how many people here have seen the Peter Pan remake and the uh, the Pinocchio remake? I, have not seen I haven't seen either. the Pinocchio one. I've seen the Peter Jesus Pan one. Christ, Peter Pan Pinocchio and Wendy, one man. right? Peter Pan and Wendy. Um, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, Peter Pan yeah. and Wendy. Like I've seen the last three Disney remakes and. Man, like it, it's it's shockingly bad, all of them. But the thing is, with the likes of Pinocchio and the Peter Pan remake, you have these wonderful secondhand cringe moments, like when um, uh, your what's the name of the the girl who was in Resident Evil? Oh, Mia Jovovich. Jovovich. Yeah, Mia Jovovich. Yeah. Her daughter flies up, and then she says, "This pyre belongs to no boy." Uh, yeah. Really cringy, like just great stuff, and and you can kind of enjoy it on that level, kind of ironically. The Little Mermaid doesn't have really any of those moments. It's just boring. You can't even enjoy it on a kind of secondhand ironic cringe level. It, it's too boring for that. But that's why I think it, it's if you wanted to achieve their goals, I think it's actually quite a clever movie because there's a lot of people that's like, well, I don't see what the problem is. It's like, no, you don't because it happened a long time ago. You've probably not seen it. You won't remember it. If you just watch it, you may not pick up on what it is. But if you compare the scenes between them, the changes they've made are small, but they make massive changes to the character. Like yeah, in the, the the kiss the girl thing, um, I've got the line written down somewhere, um, but it, it says something like, uh, "Go ahead and go ahead and do it." The only way you'll find out, it doesn't require any words. And they changed it to something like, um, "Just ask her first; it'll be fine. You'll find out." And it's like you wouldn't notice that if you didn't know the original line. But when you compare the two, that's when it makes an impact. Like the whole thing um, between how the father acted, between being essentially this abusive character. And uh, somebody who like really cares for his daughter and doesn't want to do this, but has no other option, and so he, he's he's doing something horrible because he has to because it's for her benefit. Those are very narrow lines. And if you, if this was on Disney Plus, so that you could show those two scenes back to back, it would be an entirely different movie, and people would see it. But on the movie, um, it's missed. It's easily glanced over you with lots of other people, and so I think this movie would get panned a hell of a lot more if it was. Um, you could put out the actual work to compare the two properly. Yeah, it's been very sterilized. And also Ursula's song, they removed the line, uh, on land it's much preferred for ladies never to say a word. Or mm-hmm. And they removed that because now, it, you know, when a woman wants to speak up, she has to speak up. Which, I mean, forget about the fact that Ursula's whole motivation is to convince Ariel, so it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Um, she's perfectly happy to lie and say whatever she has to say to get Ariel to agree to the potion, but these, these fucking writers, they don't care. It, they don't no. care about believability. They don't care about character motivation. Like, it doesn't matter that Ariel has never seen a, a, a helm before and she doesn't know how to steer a, how to pilot a ship. She's going to save herself in the final scene where she has to maneuver a trade vessel through a storm into the giant sea, which, which is a really difficult maneuver. You need to be a very experienced pilot. 
doesn't matter. None of it matters. All that matters is getting the message across to the audience and to hell with believability and character motivation. That was the other thing they did. Uh, because they removed the motivation from characters, they had to fake motivation, which didn't really make any sense and didn't leave any impact, but it's the only thing they could do. Like in the original one, uh, she likes the statue because it's her love. She says, I love him. In the new one, she doesn't love him. She's going out there for the world. As the actress said, it's, it's about her, her motives. Um, and so there's no reason for her to like this statue. So what did they do? Well, they put Sebastian on the statue. So now it looks like the father is trying to murder Sebastian <laughs> and the, the, when actually he's going for the statue. She's like, no, don't kill Sebastian kind of thing. She just screams no. And so they had to fake it. But then she's hogging the statue, which doesn't make sense because why would she even care about the statue to begin with over everything else is destroyed? And you find out if you remove her loving this guy before she leaves the ocean, none of it makes sense. For instance, why would you ever take a contract that you've got to got true love's kiss for a guy that you don't already love? You are now gambling that you will fall in love with a guy genuinely in three days, which is insanity. Like, even <laughs> from your perspective, convincing him to fall in love with you is an entire, is a one prospect. You falling in love with a guy that you've never met in three days is an entirely different one. So they destroy the entire movie just because, like, oh, well, sh we can't have her doing it for a map. Why? Like, n never explain why. It's like, well, we can't do this. Okay, but why? What is your problem with it? Instead, they just state how they would prefer it to be and not what was actually the problem that they've got with the original one. Because I, I think if you find out the reasons why they want to change everything, it it's not complimentary, uh, which is why you never hear about them. Well, well this is, like, we got the, the, the sort of mask-off moment with um, uh, WandaVision, where it's like, why, why is Doctor Strange not in this when it's, like, totally his bag? This is what he should be helping out with. And Kevin Feige just straight up said, well, we didn't want a, a man telling Wanda how to do magic. That that that, that just wouldn't be allowed. It's like, okay, yeah. well, okay, and, fine. And that's, a, it's like, it's like they're stepping through the minefield of social justice, you know, and instead of just worrying about what makes a good story, what makes a good show, what makes a good movie, they're actively always stepping around what we could do this for the story but there might be a blue-haired weirdo on twitter that gets mad about this so we we can't go in that direction so instead of benefiting the story let's benefit the activist and that's how you get this mishmash of nonsense and then you end up like you said earlier with eric not saving the day you know uh and ariel saving the day you know what i mean that that's how you get to the point so you've stripped him of all of his character development which ruins pretty much the whole baseline of the movie that's how we end up in this place right here and um, well, let me let me ask you, you know. this and i'd be interested to get your perspectives on this to what extent do you think disney are making these changes to appeal to this mythical modern audience to try to appeal to the woke demographic and to what extent is it just the fact that the writers in disney right now and the other cre creatives um, genuinely believe all this crap, all this political stuff that natural attraction between men and women is bad now and uh, marriage is patriarchal and all of the other uh, far left nonsense that they throw into their movies. To what extent is it just, uh, well, let's play to what we perceive to be the zeitgeist and to what extent is it they are true believers? What do you think? <laughs> Well, I mean, we've heard the executives in the leaked Zoom calls talk about this stuff specifically, talk about their direct motivations for uh, pushing this stuff. Um, and do they actually believe it? I mean, I'm of the belief that a lot of the people in the corporate positions that push this stuff uh, are more so doing it to keep uh, those that preach the loudest have the most to hide, something I always say. So the more that they're out there pushing this stuff, it's because they're trying to cover up for their own flaws. And so the harder they're out there pushing this messaging uh, to try to pretend, hey, we're not racist, you know, because we put a black person in a movie. So I don't know how much they believe it, but I do know that they are obsessed with pushing it out there. And we've seen the leaked Zoom calls from executives within Disney with that reimagined tomorrow uh, that was leaked by a thing as Christopher Rufo was his name. Um, so all of that was leaked. And we heard them talk about the not so gay agenda uh, with the identity politics agenda with uh, there was one there was one executive, some lady can't remember her name. And she talked about having a trans child and, you know, and that that was threw up red flags for everybody like, wait, what? And so the, the people that are involved with Disney at a corporate level absolutely positively are pushing it, whether they believe it or not. I have no idea, but they certainly are pushing it and they are they are actively hiring people that will carry out these uh, agendas for them. That is a fact. I mean, the people at the very, very, very highest, you've got to get like money grubbers up there, right? Like people who just only care about the money. And then they've got to be convinced that this is a smart thing to do for money. 
the like the old way won't work anymore, I guess. But then you'll listen to I as I do, unfortunately, listen to audio commentaries or interviews. I'm sure you guys have checked them out once in a while, where you see these writers and directors who do seem to believe fully uh, in any and all messages that can be drawn very overtly from any movie they want to create. So you're like, oh, so I guess I guess they do believe in it? Question mark. But it's really hard to tell the difference because if they didn't, would they not be saying this shit anyway? Like, it just seems like it's, you don't want to go yeah, too far like, off track, you know? It, it's like safe stuff to say, like the, the party line that you're supposed to toe, I suppose. Um, and so, yeah, I don't imagine too too many of them would stray too far from that. Um, I, I think, you know, as people have pointed out before as well, like the the whole ESG score is like a yes, massive thing for these that companies. That is a huge now. thing. It's yes. like if you want to get uh, money, like if you want to be able to borrow money to make up your shortfall while you wait for your next revenue stream to come in, um, you, you need to like comply with ESG or you're just not going to get it. You're not going to be considered a good investment and people won't put money into you and they won't lend you money. And so you wonder as well, like, well, how much of it is they they know this is bullshit. They hate having to do it, but they're obliged to do it. They've got like they're over a barrel on this one. And it's like either we do this thing and piss off some of our audience or we don't get any money in which case we can't pay our bills and we just can't make anything and our whole business flops like uh, i i don't know um it seems well, like a pretty we, crappy situation to be in if that's the case well we saw a base and i know this is it doesn't apply directly but it does uh indirectly but we saw a baseball player the other day mm -hmm. for the toronto blue jays share a message on his instagram it was um a christian message about you know the wokeness and propaganda and all of that and he shared it on his instagram about rejecting a lot of these companies like target and bud light and all of that it was just his personal account he shared it and there was a lot of backlash, I guess. And by backlash, there was probably like five people um, with pronouns in their bio that were upset. And so the, the organization forced him to make a public apology. So he comes out the next day and he says, I would like to apologize to the pride community. And I am going to be using Toronto Blue Jays resources to help better educate myself. And it's like, this guy clearly doesn't believe what he's saying right now. He's yeah. a multimillionaire baseball player. He clearly doesn't believe a damn thing he's saying right now, but he was forced into it by the powers that be over some nonsense on social media. So the guy, like, you'll hear that soundbite, and if you don't know any better, you think, oh, this guy just made a mistake, and he believes what he's saying now. No, he, he doesn't believe it. He was forced <laughs> to say that. And that's that's kind of a, you know, a kind of example of what you're seeing across the board right now. And I remember there was um, Adam Carolla. He was asked in an interview one time. I can't remember. I'm not going to direct quote him, but he basically just said, uh, they asked him, like, how many Republicans are, are in Hollywood? And he said, all I'm going to say is if you don't see him talking about politics, they're more than likely a Republican. Well, there, and then people started naming names, Jerry Seinfeld, Jay Leno, or just, you know, whoever, Robert Downey Jr. You know, and so it's just like he, he and he leaned into that pretty hard. And so there's a lot of people in Hollywood, powerful people that, again, I don't care what you believe. I don't care who you vote for. And it, it, none of my business. Uh, obviously, I make my st stance pretty clear on that on my personal channel, but it's about the idea that one group of people can say whatever they want on one side and there's another group that can't say anything about what they believe. And that is a big problem right there. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters that you can't say it, though. That's the problem is that you, there's one side that can say it and another side cannot even mention it or they will be excommunicated from Hollywood immediately if they spoke of one political party in, in a positive way. Yeah. And that's the problem. No, it's an interesting one. It reminds me of uh, Bob Chapek when he he did the crazy Jesus, thing of just not weighing video. in on, yes. yeah, on, on yes. all the political stuff in Florida. It's like you know our policy is just going to be we're going to sit this one out because we're not we're not a political advocacy group. We're an entertainment company, and oh, he got shown <laughs> the the correct way very quickly. Yes, and yeah, he had to put that that absolutely cringeworthy video out <laughs> where it's like they might as well have just had a gun to his head like that. Like, he's an executive, he but he's 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 not an actor. You can tell. You, you could see it in his eyes. It was they may as well have had him in a jumpsuit with a plain yeah. white background, so the CIA CIA country is his location. It was, it was well, brutal to watch. Well, he I was mean, interviewed you... about that, and um, he said, "So, what did you learn from that?" And he said, "Well, we learned that the center of our business is our staff, because uh, when we talk to people <laughs> who go to the parks, uh, it's the interactions between them and the staff that matter." And it was essentially said, yeah, it looked like the guy who's the CEO, who's just being held hostage by everyone underneath him. It's like, I know this is a bad idea, but it, all my employees will walk, it seemed to be the impression he had. 
And so he, he didn't feel like he had any other choice. Um, yeah. And that's why I would take, like, I'd just be like, well, you've done this, bye. And it's so easy. But they don't do anymore because they have the impression that everyone else believes it, which is, is the entire point. And I think you have a spectrum of people. So, you, yeah, you've got the money men. You've got the people who really believe it. But I think there's a significant amount of people who just want an easy life and they'll go along with anything and they don't really care either way. And so if this feels like the dominant social order, that's what they're going to go with. And I think that's the majority of people. Uh, so I, I, I don't think the whole group of people who are like, I believe this, but I'm going to stay silent are the massive other thing. I think it's just whichever seems like the most powerful opinion in society, a lot of people just go, yeah, I'll just I'll just say that. I'll just repeat Yeah, the they point. go along to get along. It's really interesting mm. when you look at the comparisons between 1960s China during the Cultural Revolution with the Red Guards because the vast majority of the Red Guards were young, naive people. Women especially really got into it. And you look at the comparisons, especially on university campuses today with young Americans, it's really crazy. There's tons of parallels between those two time periods. Um, you know, everything that hap happens today, big political movements, it's all happened before. You just need to go back, often not very far in history, and you will see the parallels. Um, the, the Cultural Revolution in China, where people will go along with crazy stuff just to get along. Um, for example, people and weird stuff. Like in China, people stopped playing Go. Do you know what Go is, that little Chinese chess game? Yeah. They stopped playing Go because Go was uh, an, an old traditional game and all of the old stuff had to be torn down and destroyed to make way for the new and revolutionary China. So even though, people really, <laughs> even, <laughs> even though people really enjoyed things like Go and even tea houses, they had to stop going because uh, if they went there, it would be bad for them. Uh, they could be we would, what we would today call cancelled um, in the 1960s China. They could have been cancelled in this in that they lost their reputation, they lost their job, and if things got really bad, they would be sent off to the equivalent of a gulag. So the parallels are there. It's quite interesting. Uh, they're well, they're it, willing to go along to get along. I, I think, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to young people, like, yeah, they are idealistic and they're easily manipulated and they've got all this, like, energy that they want to vent out into the world. And it's really easy to direct that in the direction that you want to do it. Uh, and once you've got them on board, like they, they become like a very easy tool to use. So I can, yeah, I can definitely see how they like in campuses and stuff across America. Yeah, it's pretty easy to get them and get them to think the way you want to think and get angry about the things that you want them to be angry about. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like going back to like the Bob Chapek thing, I mean, like in the, from my, you know, experience and just common sense, the, from the corporate perspective, the, <laughs> The illusion of <clears throat> uh, the perception of power is an illusion that no one really has power. There's not one person in a corporate structure that has any power because everybody has somebody to answer to. Even the guy at the top has people to answer to. I worked in retail for 15 years. And when I was a, a store manager at a major grocery store chain, you would have people, the Karens, you know, it's a meme now, but like when people want to come in and I want to speak to the manager, their perception is they're speaking with someone with power. I had no power outside of a few things I could do within a store level. But when it came to major decisions within the store, I, the store manager, had no power to make decisions. I had to get approval from five different people above me at a corporate office to make any real changes. And that same type of process went up the chain. My boss had to still get five people to approve him making major decisions. And it goes all the way up the corporate chain. So someone like Bob Chapek, when he had that hostage video, it just showed us like, None of these guys, they, these guys are walking a tightrope of trying to please so many people. No one knows what they really believe. What we do know is that it's all controlled and uh, there's no true power by one individual in a lot of these. I mean, <clears throat> Elon Musk has true power. He's the richest man in the world. But he's I was, was going to say, few. yeah, like when you when you literally buy the company and you own it and you're not like essentially right. answerable to a board of directors, then you've got power because you can right. like reshape it any way you want. It's like my company. I can do what I want with this. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a rare instance. Like these Very CEOs rare. are just appointed. Like they're they're yes. guys who hold a position for a, a short amount of time, relatively speaking, and then they move on. Yes, and they can have to, go. They have to play the the popularity game for the most part and appease the people underneath them. It can go the other way in a corporation as well, because it's such a behemoth of a company. Even if you're the CEO, you're not going to know everything that's going on. And so you could have somebody who's like, go and make this TV show. It comes back like, what on earth is this mess? How are we going to deal with this? We've spent 300 million on it, and this is what I have. And so um, this is why the managers and stuff are so important, and your hiring department are so important. And 
the the issue is after a while if your hr has been hiring people that agree with them which is kind of reasonable because that's what you'd expect from a hiring department if they uh, want to go a certain way they're going to hire people that agree with them uh, so that they there's a lot of people which have made videos saying you know we check your social media before we hire you uh which is what that's for um and so you get to a point where you can look at, back at your company. It's like, I don't even know what this company is anymore. Because underneath you, it's been slowly uh, sort of taken over through different hires. And you end up, this is why when he's like, well, the staff do this. Like, well, what's he going to do? Fire everybody that disagreed with him? Because that was basically his only option. And so you can be sitting on the throne. But even if you had all the power in the world, unless you're going to go Elon Musk's route and just fire nearly everybody in your company and, and go back to a sort of a core of people... They're they're looking, Disney are looking for solutions. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's well, like, it, look at the script writers. They go on it, strike it, and tie comedy yep. guy to a hole. Exactly. Shout out to Jamie Kimmel who can't work because they don't have people writing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but like, uh, it, it, at its core, it's real simple. Gina Carano was fired. Pedro Pascal still has a job and they literally posted the same thing. It just interpreted well, Pedro ways, Pascal so. posted far worse stuff. Well, he, he did technically, like, yeah. Uh, from a technical, I mean, obviously, he responded to me when when I, you know, tweeted tweeted that out and uh, made fun of my accent too, by the way. Um, whereas Gina posted something, and her the motivation behind what she was posting was completely different. Like Pedro was actually trying to disparage half the country and shame them, whereas Gina was making a message that, hey, this political. Uh, you know, persecution of people. We should we should think about the the road we're going down. And she got fired, and Pedro still there. I guess. I mean, we don't know. We don't know who's under the helmet. Still, I haven't watched still, Mandalorian. Still voice acting so. in Mandalorian. He said, <laughs> yeah. I think he had put it recently in an interview that he's just he's not turning up. It's just not happening. <laughs> Like, no, Did anyone here make it through? Even like in a ceremonial way. Three? I have not watched season three. I have not. Um, I, I watched it's, the whole thing. I made Drinker watch the finale. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mo. I really appreciate that. <laughs> we were expecting, Such actually, fun we had. in the finale that he would turn up. Because we were like, it'll be one episode. He'll arrive on set and be like, I'll do my one fucking scene. Jesus. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> like, but no, we didn't even get one. Not even one. He didn't turn up at all. And that's got to be the new contract he has with him. Where he's like, I'm going to fucking walk if you make me come on set ever again. <laughs> like, okay. Jesus Christ. Fine. <laughs> I, I'm I mean, at a Disney point... put them up for an Emmy. Like, what was it, Jack Black and Lizzo? Their appearance has gone up for an Emmy. Well, <laughs> <That's> not... confident. <laughs> I, I hope they win. I really do. Like, fucking destroy the, the credibility of the Emmys. <laughs> Go for it. I, I'm at a point, I, I'm completely done with Disney Star Wars. Disparu does a far better job of covering it than I could at this point. I have no energy left for it. It's I'm so dead. I'm so dead to Star Wars that I just, <laughs> I'm not going to watch Ahsoka series. I don't care about any of this stuff. I didn't, the only thing I... My audience convinced me to watch Obi-Wan. And for the first time, I had to turn to my audience. I hated them all for making me do that. Uh, that, was, that was pure torture. Uh, they tortured me. That was, might be the worst thing Disney's produced. That says a lot, by the way. It's a very mm -hmm. low or high bar, whichever perspective you want to look at that. But I think Obi-Wan Kenobi might be the single worst thing Disney's produced up to what I've seen. I didn't see Book of Boba Fett. I haven't seen Mandalorian Season 3. Um, there's been a lot of the more recent stuff I haven't seen, but Obi Wan Kenobi was unbelievably bad, and I think that was Except the last Raven, thing I watched. Co honestly, so, come, come back to us when you've seen <laughs> Book of Boba Fett because I think that <laughs> might change your mind. <laughs> uh, just like while we're we're here, like I know Jeremy, you've only got so much time this <laughs> evening. Um, do you have enough time to to yeah, let's hang go. with us uh, a little bit longer? Yeah, yeah I'll, right. I'll hang for another twenty or thirty. So. Okay, yeah, every time probably. I tell Drinker I got an hour, I end up saying an hour and a half because I, yeah, I just love that's, being here on open bar. That's the nature of the bar. You know, it <laughs> sucks right. you in. Um, well, here, here's an interesting thing, right? Because most of you guys here are probably fans of uh, Lord of the Rings. We've we've mm -hmm. all seen the movies. We've enjoyed them. Oh, and no, uh, no, one of our no, characters no, no. that we, we've enjoyed has been Aragorn. He's your classic <laughs> uh, male archetype hero. You know, an awesome character. Uh, and there's a little description of him, actually, in uh, the book itself. Um, I can just run you through that now. So he threw back his hood, revealing um, a face that was, sorry, a, a shaggy head of dark hair flecked with gray and and in a pale, stern face, a pair of keen gray eyes. Now, that's a, that's a decent enough description of the character, but it turns out it's wrong. Well, at least according to Wizards of the Coast, if I can show you their interpretation of the character, it'll all be 
this is going to save lives, by the way. Uh, you guys thought Eternals saved lives. This is going to save lives. This, this is, is going to end racism? Yeah, this is there well. We it, it apparently was already ended, but now it's back, and we gotta we gotta battle it again. So that's exactly. I, I what just think doing. they missed racism an reloading. Yeah. <laughs> if you're gonna do it with one character, at least announce your first one as Gandalf the Black. I mean, come on, it's the joke's just sitting there waiting for it. Uh, did you say racism is reloaded? Is that what you said? <laughs> <That's> what... <laughs> Let's make a movie out of it. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> there we go oh man so, <laughs> this is our new aragorn reimagined <laughs> now like this uh you know, i'm not uh, i'm not too familiar with wizards of the coast but i know that uh, they do magic the gathering and this is their like collectible card game and it's uh, it's pretty much the biggest one um <laughs> in the whole industry and you know they've got they've got a lot of people um bought into their stuff the problem is they seem to be on a bit of a crusade to like divide and destroy their fan base over the past few years. And well, yeah, you get stuff like this. Um, this is this is Aragorn now. Um, it's an interesting choice. I'll say that much. <laughs> it's it's honestly stuff like this is it's without being a meme like a, be serious. But it's disrespectful to black people, and this is what Eric July talks about a lot. Like, stop giving black people, like, white people sloppy seconds. You know, like, why are they so, why do they think that black characters can't stand on their own merits? Why do they think they have to hijack, you know, uh, the history or the name of a, a character that isn't black? Why can't they just create genuine, you know, brand new non-white characters and build them up? Batman didn't become the biggest superhero in the in the world overnight. It took years and years of development. Same with Spider-Man, same with Batman, same with Wolverine. You know, characters have to take it takes time to develop a following. It doesn't just happen instantaneously. And it's just disrespectful. It's disrespectful. You guys are gonna have to catch me up. What happened to Vigo Mortensen? I just don't get it. I know I've seen him in a while, but <laughs> I just think this is a controversial decision and I don't know. <laughs> I just think like, yeah, with companies like that, they um I mean they seem to go out of their way to antagonize their own fan base and like stuff like this just seems almost designed to grab headlines and just stir up controversy because they can. Yeah. Um you know, it it's just no, nobody reads Lord of the Rings and interprets Aragorn as looking like this. And nope. it's it's not an attempt to like gatekeep. It's not an attempt to say like, well, you you can't have um, different ethnicities in fantasy. But it, it is an attempt to say you should at least be faithful to the source material. Um, and th this is the exact opposite of that. This is re. Uh, reworking all of this stuff and turning it into something it was never intended to be to suit your current day uh, political agenda. Well, and it, it's so, it's disrespectful to Tolkien and it's disrespectful to the world he created and it's disrespectful to all the people who are fans of his work. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, to simplify it, it's disrespectful to literally everyone. There, there's no one that this is respectful to. It's it's disrespectful to black people. It's disres disrespectful to white people. It's disrespectful to literally anybody that's interested in this universe, people that created the universe, people that were interested or could be interested in the future. It's It's universally disrespectful. And what I will say, and I've talked about this recently, I've been talking about this stuff for years. And when I first started talking about it, it, it was it was pretty tough waters. You know, you would get a lot of criticism online when you would talk about, you know, race swapping, identity politics, wokeness, yada, yada, yada. The backlash is massive right now for stuff like this. Every time we're seeing one of these race swap situations, the, I've, I've been having so much fun looking at the memes, looking at the comment sections of these tweets uh, that they're. Every response is people going, what the hell is wrong with you? What are you guys doing? Uh, normal people are finally realizing how broken this entire system is that uh, that they're you know just ruining everything that, that came before it. I don't I mean, know, man. Cleopatra was really popular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, my grand told me that she was actually bad, so uh, I'm, I'm convinced, you know. Hey, doubled the audience score in 24 hours. That's, a success. That's true. Hey, they tripled it overall. Oh, did they? I didn't know yeah, it got yeah, up again. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it got up to 3%.
It's like an epic <laughs> redemption arc, you know? Like <laughs> slowly clawing their way back up. You need to make a competing um, like documentary with your own grandparents being like, what that one said was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know the truth. The oh, man. But like, well, I, I, like the, 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 go ahead, this room. I, I get the feeling that, like, I, I know a lot of people say, well, you know, it's, it's outrage marketing. That makes sense for the company. They make money. Doesn't make sense for the people doing it. So they've got to have a personal reason of why they're so invested in doing this kind of thing. And I just, I just think it, like, people are driven to leave some kind of lasting legacy. And if they made an original character in Lord of the Rings from, like, a far-off land that came over, no would care. And that's the problem. It'd be like, well, you know, here's a new guy. Okay, whatever. Fair enough. And so they wouldn't leave, like, a lasting impression. But if you go and you Im like, like implant yourself and change something that people already love, like care about, then you're affecting something that's already lasted for decades and gives you a chance. And they just re I still think it's a lot of it is very childlike. It just gives them attention. And they don't care whether people are ranting and raving at them. If anything, they probably get off on it. The fact that they've affected you so much that you're now talking about them personally, it makes them feel like they matter. Yeah, also yeah. they can brag to their friends at cocktail parties. They can say things like, oh my God, me and my company made a, a Lord of the Rings character black and now we're getting all this hate online from these troll racists. It's mm -hmm. so all the MAGA, All the MAGA crowd is hating on us and uh, all the racist yeah. trolls are. They do stuff like this. In my opinion, this is almost like uh, trying to plant the seeds for what the, the intent is. Like, So we go back to solo and solo lost money i don't know if anyone's aware of that but solo was the first star wars film to ever lose money the intent behind solo was to begin the recreation of george lucas's star wars and if that movie would have been successful the intent was to replace alden ehrenreich as the symbol of han solo and not harrison ford they wanted everyone to think alden ehrenreich not harrison ford and if that movie would have been successful that would have been the beginning, in my opinion, of them recreating the original trilogy, recasting Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, or just redoing the original trilogy all over again, because that's what they ultimately want to do. Having this situation with the Black Aragorn introduced through, uh, was it Wizards of the Coast? Is that what it is? Yeah, um, so from what I can tell, so, they, they, they're the ones who produced the Magic yeah. the Gathering cards. This is like putting little fillers out there. To kind of prep for what the ultimate, you know, goal would be is to if we could get to a point to, you know, remake Lord of the Rings with a black, you know, Aragorn, uh, you know, black Legolos, which we already had that in Rings of the Power, by the way. Shout out to Don Lemon. But um, oh, we'll so get to him in a minute. Don't <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and so that's that's them putting little fillers out there to try to kind of get into the to, to the public's mind to say, Just, you're you know, we it's okay to have black people in Lord of the Rings and shit like that. So again, the backlash is good. It's why solo losing money was good, and um, I'm glad more and more people are calling it. They're out. gonna make three of those solo movies, weren't they? I think yeah, they were planning so, on a trilogy yeah. with Darth Maul as the. Uh, as the villain following his bottom surgery. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't, honestly, I can't wait for season two. Um, well, actually, that, that kind of brings me neatly along to this next bit I was going to talk about. So um, they are in the midst of filming uh, Rings of Power uh, season two. And uh, we got some insight into like the experiences of some of the actors here. Um, and particularly... What did you call him? Like uh, Don Don Lemon Loss. Don, Le <laughs> yeah, Don Lemon Loss. Don Lemon Loss. Uh, um. Well, I believe uh, Ismael Cruz Cordova is his name. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he was talking about the fact that he needed to have an onset therapist because man, he was just getting harassed so much. He couldn't handle this this abuse that he was getting from the fans. It's ridiculous. <laughs> that God damn it. That's um, what I mean about an ego boost, though, because it says, "Oh, I got a therapist." You're like, oh, he must have. You know, he must have had weekly meetings. But no, he just saw it. And just seeing her presence nearby was enough to make him feel seen. And this is why I think it's all about ego. It's literally like, her presence means that I matter because she was hired for me. And remember, all those hateful bigots, but this company really cares about me. And it's just well, there's, so there's, selfish. There's a, quote, there's a great quote for him uh, here from uh, comicbook.com where it's like, uh, you need support when this happens because the voices are so loud and they're coming at you from so many places. I loved seeing her there, his therapist, even if we didn't speak. Okay. I knew there was someone there seeing me completely. I wasn't just an actor. I was a god. <laughs> oh, I didn't take it what? that way. When he said not just an actor, I thought he meant someone seeing me completely 
and then he was having a go at the other actors. I'm like, that was that seemed like a bit of a random burn to put in there about talking about your therapist. But yeah, like, yeah, I think it comes down to what you said. It's just a bit of ego. It's uh, mm. having someone there who's assigned to me because I'm that important. I need a therapist on set to help me out. Mm -hmm. and, but they uh, all talk about that. They're changing history. They're leaving an impact. Their legacy will go on into the future because, you know, this is... What What, what was it she said? Um, this is a, a, something about... This marks where we were and, and, and it's a sign of where we need to be. It's like oh, yeah. we are literally uh -huh. leading the charge into the future. Just this represents progression. Yes, this yes. represents exactly. progression. This is, uh, for, this is a for moment a character, this is incredible. Yeah, for an actor who's barely in the show, like, good <laughs> God, she has a lot to say for herself. Uh, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you earn this right by having many mean messages, uh, where, where are all our therapists for free, huh? Where, where, where's yeah. the YouTube therapists? <laughs> hey, the listen. Messages we get? <laughs> Hey, listen, I, I say it, I'll say it here. It's perfect time to apply it, but uh, Ismail Cruz Cordova couldn't survive a Modern Warfare 2 lobby. That's no, for damn sure. No. He would be a mess if he walked into there. If he can't handle this, he, he certainly couldn't handle a Modern Warfare 2 lobby. He'd be, but again, that's what sh they should all go through Modern Warfare 2 lobby training. Uh, you can survive mean words after that. Trust me. Trust I, me. I, just, I, I think back to like the days of like the the Peter Jackson trilogy when you get the interviews with the cast and and crew and stuff and you know mm. it seemed one it seemed like a really chill set and it seemed like everyone was just there doing their jobs and stuff but two like there was a real commitment to doing like the tough work you know whether it was physical training whether it was like fight choreography like all the 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 stuff the mishaps that happen on set the injuries they just kind of soldiered through whereas. With the actors that we have for Rings of Power now, like they're getting interviewed and they're all in like the ridiculous, like flowy outfits, even the men. Um, mm -hmm. and like you know, they're there, like talking about having therapists on set because it's oh, it's all just so hard, <laughs> and it's just, I can't handle this. The guy that played like, Jurin, oh, just stop being such fucking pussies. <laughs> like, Jur you're, you're there spoke to, about like, how important warriors at least fucking like act like it. Can you not even do that? <laughs> <laughs> Pretend like you don't need to have the therapist for your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> Morphid Clark talking about how she needed therapists because she was scared when there was like orcs running at her or something. Like, I think she they were said like big she had... men and they were scary. <laughs> she had PTSD similar mm -hmm. to what war veterans have. I, I could yeah. be mistaken, but yeah, if I remember sense. correctly, yeah. people this, is like, this is like fucking movie Bob with his like, uh, the Sega Vietnam. versus Nintendo Wars was my Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> like, Fucking get into the real world, you dick. I know it, like, dude. It's... My favorite moment of the behind the scenes is when it showed her on a horse and there was a step ladder next to her so she could get onto the horse. I'm like, that's going to be really good in a battle. Hang on, I'll stop and see. I just need to find a rock first. But the Jurin actor said one of the most important things about this was they made us feel really safe on the set. It felt like a safe space. I'm like, oh, come on. What are you, what are you struggling with? Ugh. I mean, My isn't goodness, the whole man. point when you're making a fantasy show and, and and this is supposed to be a fantasy where the world is in danger and someone's coming back and all that stuff? Why would you want your actors to feel safe? I mean, uh, feel safe. I know that method acting is a specific thing, but a lot of directors also use method direction. Stanley Kubrick did this. He would play music to get his actors and actresses into a certain mood prior to a scene. Um, he had an amazing ear, by the way. But not to go too much into that, why would you want to create a safe space where everybody feels calm and relaxed and peaceful and there's a therapist over there and all this crap? This is supposed to be a, a war fantasy. These people yeah. should be on edge. When the cameras roll, you want them on edge. You want them to look and feel like their lives are in danger. Otherwise, that, how, how can the audience well, invest? The, you say the, that, the but the one, the one person that didn't get a therapist died, the whores. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but the it died, like, about... really chilled out, you know? The, <laughs> the funny thing about that is the art... Petter came out and said, why didn't they just use fake horses? I'm like, that's stupid. Who uses fake horses? And then I saw Willow backstage, and they used <laughs> fake horses in that. It had no legs, yeah. it was just a head. I'm like, I didn't know these things existed, but... <sighs> I want to crowdfund. I want to crowdfund getting Christian Bale to go on the set of uh, Lord of, or Rings of Power season two and just give a Terminator Salvation rant, just to wake them all up and let them know <laughs> this is the real world, baby. He'll trash yeah, your like, fucking yeah. lights. He'll trash yeah. your fucking lights. Uh, Ismail is there, like, oh, that's my therapist over there. Oh, good, good for, for you. you. <laughs> that was the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> You and I have done professionally. <laughs> Dude, 
no matter how many times I hear that rant, it never gets old. Right. It's the greatest thing. Christian Bale's my favorite actor, and people are like, do you want to meet him? I'm like, I want to be cussed out by him. I don't want to meet Christian <laughs> yeah. Bale and say, hey, buddy, you were great in America. So I want him to cuss me out and say we're done professionally. I want him to be angry, and I'll be like, yes. <laughs> yes. The best part of that rant is when Christian, Christian Bale says uh, – all right, guys, let's do it again. And you kind of hear McG's voice in the background saying something like, oh, maybe we uh, should maybe. Uh, break. And then he <laughs> no, goes, no, let's do it again. <laughs> We're fucking doing the scene. <laughs> oh, it's so great. Uh, uh, somebody needs yeah. to do a full animation of that moment. I, I'm surprised it hasn't been. Or maybe it has oh, been that's done. A, great a full idea. animation just... of that. Yeah, somebody has to somebody do it. Internet. Done, yeah. There's 12,000 people watching this. Somebody, somebody has to do it if it hasn't been done. Full somebody animation. Somebody out there, you have the technology. You, you have do. the will. Let's do it. Do yes. it. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> if, only they, if only they had video of it, it would have been fantastic. I know. It's... <laughs> How did it, was it? Was it leaked from like the recording from the actual cameras, or was it someone's phone? The audio, because it was too. The audio was too good to be someone's phone. Like back then, the audio would have been then, terrible. It was so, probably. Yeah leaked like from a, a hot mic, hot a mic. mic. Well, it, yeah it, yeah. it would have been just it would have been the boom mic guy wouldn't it because they, they they do the you know the video and then they've got the audio separate like with the the big overhead mics and it's probably just that like it was still yeah. just rolling i really hope it was like he's <laughs> ranting and raving and there's a guy with a boom just following him around yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, i don't care how Play tired my arms are i'm not like doing this fucking thing <laughs> Mr. Bale, can you keep going? This is gold. <laughs> this is gold. <laughs> My YouTube channel is going to explode after this. <laughs> but we talked before, right, about this. I think maybe it came from a super chat originally, but it's like talking about directors like Kubrick who were legendarily difficult and demanding and stuff. But then the end result is kind of worth it. You get like a much more intense movie, mm. a much more precise movie with great performances. Um and yeah, the question was really like, well, how much can you realistically put your actors through in terms of adversity and, and um, you know, almost like emotional um, abuse to get the right performance out of them? And it feels like, uh, you know, right now we're sitting around about zero. You know, we, we just don't want to do anything with our actors. Like, they can't be remotely uncomfortable. Uh, they can't have any kind of physical hardship. We don't want them to get uh, even a, a bump or a bruise or anything. We don't want them to feel sad. We've got a therapist on standby. And it just shows. It shows in the performances. There's no sense of, like, grittiness or realism or intensity to any of it. I, like, Rings of Power is a perfect example. No, sterile, nobody's yeah. performance throughout that like where we bought into there wasn't really a single prefer uh, person where we looked at them and thought yeah really feeling that character they nailed it there yeah no it's um yeah to your point i mean i don't know if it's true or not i'd heard a rumor they like chris uh, not chris, uh, christopher nolan like banned chairs on the sets of his <laughs> movies um that was a pretty big story i don't know if that was ever confirmed or not but i know he's notoriously I wouldn't say difficult to work with as much as he just expects, you know, uh, he has a certain level of uh, expectations for people on, on his films. And you don't get that sense from anything on Rings, Rings of Power. I mean, it all again, go back to the original interviews for it. None of them were talking about the universe that Tolkien created. They were all talking about how important it was that they are diverse now and, you know, that they're going to be, we're going to be the first ever. Like, none of them actually cared about the universe. They cared about their own personal stake and how it was going to impact their personal legacies and their opinion. And that mm -hmm. carried over into the production and the acting where they were there for themselves, not for the story. And that's kind of, you know, what we see more often than not nowadays. And yeah. I think it's generally understood, like, especially over here, there's sort of the attitude of the great British eccentric. It's someone who's going to have very strange requests. They like weird things, but people kind of like them because that breeds creativity and they're likely to go off in a different direction than other people would. And so even if they are a bit weird, if you can keep them around, they're generally quite useful, at least in something. And when you've got Hollywood, these are supposed to be the best people. They're supposed to, you, you want them to work hard. And I don't think many people care if someone's asking that you get paid really well if the rewards are worth it you're there voluntarily and this i think that's shown in things like it doesn't really harm the career tom cruise did something else he also did one of these rants at oh people. yeah hasn't harmed his career at all he's done really yeah. well i, I, for, I like for my, I, I want i want to see stuff like that mm -hmm. i want people being mm -hmm. intense and i want them yep. to care about what they're doing and if it means that they're an asshole and they go on a bit of a tirade okay fine 
you know, as long as long as it's not like fucking racist or something like that, like they're just ranting about like technical issues or frustrations with crew members or whatever. No problem, because that's that's what you expect. Like, uh, you know, the the emotion should be running high on set. People should care enough about what they're doing that they will shout about stuff. Um, and they're not constantly walking on eggshells because, oh, I don't want to offend someone. You know, I wouldn't want someone to feel threatened by me, like, being a bit overbearing. Like, that's that's how you end up with, like, a bunch of pussies, like, just talking to their therapists on set instead of actually doing work. <laughs> Yes, yes. And that's what the best movies do. They, they create some kind of emotion in you. And so you're going to have to offend people. You're going to have to push the line. You're going to have to put passion into it. Otherwise, if it's just grey and boring, then it's not going to get emotion out of you and you forget it as soon as you leave the cinema. And there's been so many movies where, by the time I got home, I can't remember it. And it's like, well, you're supposed to talk about it? I, but I've forgotten half the movie on the way back. It was that forgettable. Didn't leave an impact at all. Um yeah. And I, I think with a lot of this stuff, the intention that you go into it with shines through in the finished work. And so... Um, That's a good I point, because we, we talk about Tom Cruise, and, and we see that with him, and the passion. Mm. He is Tom Cruise is a bit unhinged, okay? And that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. And, and it shows in his work. And to Disru's point, that passion that Tom Cruise brings, like it or love it, or hate it, it shows in the film. And we tend to always love the film and that little leaked audio that we heard from him, you know, during that, like the lockdowns and all of that stuff, that that's the same passion that you get from Tom Cruise, where he's jumping off, you know, cliffs and jumping out of airplanes just to say thank you to the audience for coming to see his movie. You know, I mean, it's it's amazing. Go ahead. Just brew it up. There's a great uh, sorry. I'll, sorry. I'll, um, there's a great quote from Tandy Newton, who worked on work with him. Sorry, on Mission Impossible 2. Uh, and it's really, it's really funny anecdote where like they were doing a scene together and he was really unhappy with the dialogue that she'd been given, um, and because it was John Woo who was directing it, he like wasn't particularly great with English, and so he was sitting in a booth like um, watching the the whole thing get uh, like played out, and like Tom Cruise was like ranting at Tandy Newton like, "No, your lines don't make sense in this scene." But, like, all she could focus on was they had a zit on his forehead, and because he was so fucking intense, it was, like, getting bigger with, like, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's passing minute. <laughs> it's, really like, blood moment. pressure threatening to burst it, like, in front of her. Well, to be fair, that was the only bad Mission Impossible movie, too. It, it two wasn't was, a great two, one, two yeah. Two was terrible. Two was, that's that pretty, was the only, that's what people say, though. Like. That one's the worst one. It's, like, it's a pretty good series, then. That's very, very true. Very true. Because they are. So we got how many of those left? Two, right? Yeah. Hopefully two part billion. for a dead reckoning. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. I think that could be a billion dollar film, actually, with coming off the momentum that Top Gun Maverick and shockingly enough, Tom Cruise at this point in his career is bigger now than he's ever been. And he was already the biggest movie star we'd ever seen. He's prior. Had like, to... <laughs> he's had like three big phases of his acting career. Because he made the mm -hmm. comeback after um, Tropic Thunder, and then like yep. settled and has come like now it's like exploded after he's like the new co post COVID star. He's like yeah, the only it, one it's left. kind of like we, we're Wild. we're hungry for movie stars, and the, the question was always like, well, we need another, we need like a, a young Tom Cruise, and we didn't get one, and so eventually just actual Tom just, Cruise just stepped Tom back in, and he was like, fuck it, I'll do it myself then. <laughs> <laughs> and like then we just got him. It's like it. fine. You know, you're, you're you're 60, but you look about 40. You can still yeah. do all the action scenes. Have at it, Tom. Like, Let's go. Uh, we yeah, all we'll wait another for decade it. for the replacement. <laughs> yeah. it, it is amazing how Hollywood are able to get in their own way because you say people are hungry for movie stars, and they are. People like, like whether it's good or bad thing, people do like to idolize movie stars and things like that, and they like to see a, a real hero on screen. It's an emotionally very satisfying thing. But you take a look at someone like Henry Cavill, like 20, 30 years ago, Henry Cavill would have been a massive movie star. Yep. He would have been in everything. He would have been like the top superhero movie. Yes. But Hollywood just, they are determined to for that not to happen. It's like they don't want Henry Cavill or people like him to become big movie stars now. And, and they're going out, of, they're actually just getting in their own way. It's like, what is wrong with it? Just let him be a movie star. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The idea and, of and profit think, uh, from it. People keep like pushing the fact that, like, well, The Rock was kind of pushed in, in favor of him. Um, and there was a really interesting thread on Twitter, um, you know, a couple of weeks back talking about, like, The Rock has made, like, pff, more money than practically anyone, but, like, he doesn't have any book, he doesn't have any movie he's, legacy behind him. He's like, a manufactured thinks, movie star. He's a manufactured yeah, like, movie star. 
yeah, nobody like looks at the rock and thinks like, oh, he was he was like known for this. You're, like with Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, you'd be like, well, that was the Terminator, or that was Conan the Barbarian. You know, the pe- like roles that you remember. Whereas yes. with the rock, he doesn't have anything. It's just like I, I, I'd struggle to even uh, like the pa- think. No, wait. <laughs> the tooth fairy. Was the, <laughs> the tooth fairy. The legendary oh, yeah. CGI moment in the Scorpion King. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all Scorpion you know. King. It's all memes that he's known yeah, for. Yeah, I, I mean, like you, you can you can compare that to to like I mean Will Smith before you know he kind of lost all of like Will Smith has iconic films. We talked about this uh, recently on a live stream about Will Smith and how big he was back in the '90s and the iconic films that you can attach his name to that he was part of. You can do that with Tom Cruise. You can do that. You can even do that with Chris Pratt now. You can do it with Denzel Washington. You can't do that with The Rock. The Rock does not have a lot of films that you just attach him as like he's the single reason that this film is a billion dollar film. You know what I mean? You just can't do it. Yeah. I I, I likened him to like watching a a movie by The Rock. It's like going to McDonald's or Burger King. Like you've probably done it hundreds of times in your life, but you don't remember a single experience of it. It's just, (laughs) it satisfies the need at the time. And that's all it is. And like that, that's kind of what he is as like, uh, as a movie star, he's like the fast food joint of of yeah. uh, and actors. Black Adam really, really exposed that. Finally, it finally was exposed that he's just not the movie star that he's perceived to be. He is a star. He's a he's one of the most famous professional wrestlers ever. And I watched professional wrestling back when when during the Attitude Era, and he was amazing. You know, he and he is a yeah. star, and he went on to become a star in movies. But he is he's a manufactured star. It's because he's. I don't know what it is about him. He's such a, it's such a strange situation because he is a star. His name carries a lot of weight, but he doesn't turn the needle. It's not like you can put the rock in. You can't put most people in just anything now and it turn the needle. But with the rock, there's this perception that if the rock is starring in something, it's going to be a huge hit. And that's just not true. It just isn't true. You know what it is? He's safe. Right. If, if Disney designed movie stars instead of movies, then the rock is what they would produce. He, yeah. he is like, he never does anything really controversial. He's never involved in anything, you know, like, oh, he's in the tabloids because he said this or he did this or whatever. He never takes on a project that's like really pushing uh, the limits of, of the art or anything or something a bit different or uh, crazy. It's all just really Imagine safe, really corporatized, he... like something that allows him to be in a, a fucking khaki like shirt in the jungle somewhere. And like, the that's all it is. It's just the same thing movie. over and over again. But imagine huh? he like has to be in the whale, for example. Could you ever see him have to do a role like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be like, I almost want to see it, just to see how uncanny it would be to see him yeah. have to do a serious well, role. If you'd asked me, if you'd asked me ten years ago, could I see Brendan Fraser doing a role like that? I would have said no. Right. You know, well, like it's not an actor I would have associated with that kind well, of emotional intensity. I- I haven't seen it in a long time, but I, I think about Vin Diesel and say, you, could you see him in that role? He did do a movie called A Man Apart a long time ago. That was That's his best movie by far. I don't know if uh, it went under the radar, but it's called A Man Apart, and it's, it's he's really fucking good in the movie. Normally, if you ask me, though, to say, hey, could you see Vin Diesel in something like that? I couldn't. I certainly can't see The Rock in something like that. I guess I could be surprised, but maybe The Rock doesn't do it because he knows he can't do it. You know what I mean? Maybe that's why he's never attempted I, it. I, I, I think the, the doing... rock is the rock is more of a brand than a person. You know, like yeah, if you go to see a movie by the rock, now you kind of know what you're going to get. It's going to be a feel good sort of family oriented film. It's probably not going to be like R rated or anything like that. Not too violent. Uh, he's going to be playing like a fairly jovial, charismatic guy because that's what he is. That's what he does. And you know, I, I'm not knocking his success. He's been fantastically successful, and he's made a shit ton of money out of it. And he's good at it. It's just like it. The result is well. It doesn't create a real impression. It doesn't like make any lasting legacy for yourself. Well, it's well who is? Who do you, you think create, is a? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. If you create something which has just been like manufactured to be safe, it doesn't have any soul. It's not going to make anyone feel anything either way or the other. It's just kind of there. Whereas yeah. the difference between Henry Cavill and Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise was grandfathered in, so he was already such a big star. That if his name came up in conversations, oh, oh, he'll he'll get audiences in. Whereas Henry Cavill had to push through, and you see this in comedy. Um, if you think about, um, I'm going to have to use British comedy because I don't know American comedians. Um, but the same comedians which are on TV now over here are the same ones that were there 12, 15 years ago. They're just not funny anymore because the only ones which remain are the ones that are safe. 
There are exceptions to that, which are people like Jimmy Carr, who get away with it because he was grandfathered in, because he comes from such a long time ago, and he's such a big star, they can't get rid of him. And I think you have that with everything. Henry Cavill was... He was not the person they want on set because he will go up to the writers and say, that is wrong, you need to change it because it should be this. And that causes trouble for them. They would much rather have The Rock, who's kind of um, safe, he's just a big muscly guy that's going to fulfill the role and he's going to look the part and that's it. And he's not going to cause any trouble for them. And so if yeah. you don't rock the boat, you get moved into the position that someone like Henry Cavill would have fulfilled normally. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> I mean, the one guy that's current, that's a, that is a, I think he's a legitimate star is Chris Pratt. He's, he's kind of the one guy that's kind of come out of the last several years and he is a true movie star. He's probably the only person. And yeah, it should be Henry Cavill. I agree with your initial point when you brought up Henry Cavill. I've mentioned that many times is Cavill should be a mega star by all standards. Uh, if, if he had an industry that actually, you know, saw the value that he brings because he should be, um, but it's current Hollywood for you. I mean, one guy I would say to watch out for is uh, Alan Richson. Like he did Reacher, he was in Fast Ten. Like that guy, he's got the he's got the acting chops. He's got the the sheer fucking like presence physically. Uh, he's obviously enormous, um, and he's he's young enough to to be able to do this for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, oh, I think he? he could be. I think he's like late thirties, something like that. Hmm. Um, so yeah, like not super young or anything, but like he's got, um, you know, he's got a little bit of experience and a bit of charisma about him. And I think he could, he could go on to big things because he was, you know, like I say, he was in Fast 10. He's going to be in the next one, I would imagine. Um, you can also see in that role he played in Fast 10, watching him on screen, you realize, because he's playing a kind of ambiguous character. He's, he's kind of a villain, but he, he thinks of himself as a good guy. And you could definitely see him, like, he could play both good guy and villain roles. He's not yep. necessarily typecast. You can see that he has a diverse range just in that movie. That's a hard role, yep. what he did in Fast 10. It, like, it, you, it, you, it's easy to look at that role and think, oh, he's just playing a big, muscly guy. Like, no, he plays it really well. It's it's a hard mold to, it's a hard role to pin down emotionally, and he does a great job of it. Yeah, and he's got it, the confidence and the swagger as well, which... He does, like, and he looks helps. good in a suit. It is weird to think about what actually how how a movie star becomes to be because remember when Taylor Kitsch was like Hollywood's like they tried to push him in everything whether it was yeah. John Carter but now I, John Carter was good I thought John Carter was good it flopped but it was good but he was in a lot of stuff in a very short amount of time and it was obvious that Hollywood had keyed in on Taylor Kitsch as the next megastar and like it never Worthington. happened so yes yes yes, Sam yes. yeah Yes, and they, they tried to do it with Jonathan Majors as well, and they've had to avoid that one. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and like, I'm still shocked that Taylor Kitsch didn't become a bigger star because even though some like Battleship w flopped, John Carter flopped, he was in X Men Origins Wolverine. I wasn't it X Men Origins when he was Gambit, right? Yeah, Is that what it was. Yeah, yeah. everyone. And so I think he was unlucky that. in that. Like, if you're associated with a bunch of flops, it might not be your fault, but it yeah, just yeah, yeah. kills your career. You know? yeah. What happened to and Michael Fassbender? Fassbender. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 But yeah, I, I, I don't know if Taylor Kitsch is doing anything these days, but I always liked him as an actor, but it never happened. And yeah, we've seen other pushes like that. Uh, Sam Worthington, I never understood that one. Uh, no, no. He is boring as fuck. And <laughs> he just, I agree. He yep. is boring as hell. And uh, like, I, I'm one of the five people on the planet that likes Terminator Salvation. He was okay in that movie, I guess. But I rewatched that right, and I I like that movie. Dude. I I've love Terminator Salvation, dude. I love it. I, know, I, I, know, I don't love it, it but I'm, I'm I'm all right with it. I just feel like he's like his character is the weakest part of that film. Like yes, he doesn't need yes. to be in it. Yeah, uh, I love it. Salvation. More John Connor, like it would have been much better. Yeah, Salvation just uh, aesthetically, I love the look it's of that no... film. Genesis um, Dark Fate, okay? They're a different tier of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> three and Salvation are what bad movies used to be. Here's a quick yeah, question. That. Which movie was worse, Genesis or Dark Fate? Uh, I Dark Fate. Dark I, Fate, yeah. Honestly, I, I, I didn't watch either one of them. Didn't watch either one of them because they were so... I, say, it was obvious how bad they were going to be. I'd say Genesis is worse, you know? They, um, they, Dark, will be, Dark like, they both is... fucking destroy the timeline like really badly. <laughs> uh, I just... I hate the, the concept behind Dark Fate where it's like... Oh, you you stop Judgment Day, 
And like I, I'm from a different timeline, so I don't know what Skynet is, but like we've got Nemesis or whatever the stupid Legion fucking thing's called. Brinker, Legion, the other generic yeah. name. <laughs> generic evil sounding name, yeah, Legion. And it's the same exact shit, and they're acting like it's totally different. It's just oh god. Next one will be Chat GPT seventeen or something. <laughs> I, I just want to merge them and just have it like Dark Genesis or something. <laughs> when you just, look like, at Genesis, all the worst the, aspects. The on-screen couple of uh, Denari Stormborn and what's his name? Like that's just like <laughs> oil and water. Just yeah. it, it, they just had no chemistry. It's one of the oh. great awful on-screen couples. We go further back. It's a horrific miscast slash misdirection for um, Jai Courtney. I think is the actor, right? They're making they made Michael Beaton's Kyle Reese who's this scrawny survivor who's yeah. desperate, PTSD-ridden, and a fucking twitchy. They made him a meathead. He's like a jock. It's like, what the yeah. fuck is this? Like, I the know, guy I, walking I, around like, oh, I don't know the book is worth. <laughs> like, other people like, tell me what to do. I was so like, what the fuck is Kyle Reese? What is this? He's, he's I don't watched a lot of Harry the thing is, I don't, I don't hate Jai Courtney as an actor either. Like, he's actually no. had some good moments. Like, But yeah, he was horribly, horribly miscast for this. Like I said, either the casting or the direction, something went wrong. What the fuck was that? Well, like, I, I, I think even uh, Amelia Clark's come out and said, like, yeah, that was not a happy set. Like, we knew we were making a garbage <laughs> movie, and we just had to like see it through. Well, yeah, Disney right. recently, uh, Adi said all the writing for all the T two sequels is shit, basically. <laughs> yeah. He's right as well. Well, we were just waiting. We all knew we were just waiting for once your fucking contracts expire, or when you were just like feeling a bit ballsy. <laughs> but I, yeah, um, I'm with you on picking either Genesis or Dark Fate. I had this conversation many times because the two big things for me are like, if you want to fuck up Terminator, what do you do? You grab John and make him the leader of the fucking Terminators, or you just kill him when he's a kid with Arnie. It's Oof, like, those man, two sound bad. pretty fucking insulting. And it's like they did both of them. And then they have, like, in Genesis, you have the stupid new lame robot being like, you're a relic from a deleted timeline as he's holding like Arnie and it's just like shut up like the metaphor for the whole Ugh. series and then of course you have Dark Fate where they literally erase Terminator 2, 3, 4 like I know that we, like, they erase Salvation 3 and you know but then they also um, they fuck with Terminator 1 completely I, it's all it's all fucked it's, it's like everything and then, and then they just replace it all right like they have instead of John now it's a girl and she does the exact same thing we have Sarah who doesn't want to be a mum anymore. Um, oh, the, the, sounds the character art for like, 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 Linda Hamilton was just fucked. Like, like advising, advising the girl to not be used for your womb. That was some bullshit. Uh, it's, it's really tough because when you were super invested in Terminator 1 and 2, like I am, um, you, you, you love the mother aspect. It, it's so important to shaping John into the leader he's going to become. The idea that Sarah would ever have looked back on all of that time as people only used me for my womb. Yeah, like watch T2 like, and oh, then like hell. watch yeah, watch mm. Dark Fate and it's gonna it'll blow your mind how, how much it's, they it's fucked a fight. her character. Um I consider uh, Genesis a bit more goofy while Dark Fate is much more spiteful. Well, let uh, me ask you a question more, because we may have talked on, about this briefly, like and I'll put this to the whole panel. Like, where do you guys stand on Terminator three? I have a rise of the I, machines. I, I, I'm happy to say it's bad, but I don't mind watching it. <laughs> I think Terminator 3's. I think Terminator 3 deals with a lot of the problem that the Dark Knight Rises deals with is that they're not near as good as the thing that came before it, and they get criticized to hell. Dark Knight Rises has a lot of problems. Terminator 3 has a lot of problems, but they followed two of the greatest action films ever made. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the expectations were monumentally high for both of the films, and so um, I think it's almost like people that didn't like the prequels after watching the sequels they go back and watch the prequels eh, it's not that bad you know terminator 3 not that bad after seeing everything well, else you know I, I i could quite happily divide the terminator franchise into three chunks like terminator 1 and 2 absolutely fantastic some of the go best good. action yes. movies ever made oh yeah uh yes. terminator 3 and salvation pretty badly flawed and like a lot of problems but i can mm. tolerate them like they, they don't destroy everything yeah. and then you get into like the genesis dark fate territory where it's just utter trash that has no yeah. reason to exist I mean, t3 is a decent movie that the, the term i really like the terminator the female terminator she's hot she's sexy she looks good on screen like she's wearing this tight leather they're just kind of giving the male audience what they want with that it's fun um, mm. and she's a good villain she plays it well um, Arnie's great in it. Uh, I think John Connor's miscast in T3. Yeah. Um, oh, but, next style. Uh, Remember him? 
Yeah, he, he yeah. wasn't good in that. Like, if they'd got a much better John Connor, they couldn't get uh, uh, what's his name because he was a drug addict, drug addict at the time. Yeah, Furlong, Edward Furlong. Uh, I wasn't. They couldn't get Edward Furlong because, um, which is a shame because he wasn't. Man, his whole career, what happened to him is a real shame because when it's so rare that you look at a child actor and you think, wow, that is a natural talent. Like, he was an amazingly naturally talented actor. It's just a terrible shame what happened to him. But overall, T3, uh, decent movie. And I also love the ending. I think it is a great yeah. ending. I, I, like, I like the ending as well. Uh, I think it, we can, we can shelve a very heated discussion on how bad that ending is some other day. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could get into the question of paradoxes more, but yeah, like that's, that's probably a discussion that's for not, another That's day. not the point I'm trying to make. No fate but what we make? Nah, fuck that. <laughs> Hey, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take I, my, I like the idea that quick. you couldn't escape. Oh, sorry, man. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm gonna take my leave real quick. Thank you, guys. I'm not gonna drag it out. So uh, every time I come here, I say I'm gonna stay for an hour. I end up staying nearly two because I love it so much. <laughs> so I Bar appreciate you, you guys. Yes. It's uh, it's good to be on and uh, chat. I love you all. Appreciate it. You guys have a good uh, rest of your show and drinker tomorrow. F and T. So yes, right? I'll get it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I will get um, what the fuck was I watching? Uh, yeah, it across the Spider Verse finished. And, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Do all it. Right. So yeah, I'll one, be on Friday night tights tomorrow. Join us there. Hell yeah. All right, one nine nine in the chat. I love you guys. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, man. Funnily enough, uh, right. I remember conversations about T three when it's coming out, and I remember one of the bigger things my friends were talking about was seems like the two is downgraded. She's just the T one thousand, but worse. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, like. Yeah. Where'd you go? You've made a liquid Terminator, and now you're like, yeah, but we'll give him a skeleton frame as well. It didn't really make any sense. <laughs> I think but... Terminator, like, what was that 3D ride that they did? Like, Terminator Battle Across Time or something? Like, it was like, you know, Universal Studios. Mm. Um, I, I think they took it to its logical conclusion, where it becomes like this giant amorphous monster thing made out of liquid metal that's like, you know, the size <laughs> of a dragon or something like that. Like, that's, that's pretty much as far as you can go as far just... as Terminators go. The T-1000 is fucking iconic, and it makes so much sense in terms of... It feels like it fits so well as a sci-fi creation at the at an yep. end point. It's like, holy fuck, that thing is efficient. And the only thing that's left is that it can co form complex machines. Obviously, they said it couldn't because they need to fucking nerf that thing. It's insane. But if you wanted to develop it further, maybe it can. Maybe it can form a gun. Maybe it can't, you know, like... But, but they made her... And I was going to say, I actually agree with all the compliments you gave to her i think her performance is good i think she's hot as well and it's like a good idea and stuff it's just that i was just kind of straight she was beaten by a magnet i was like oh yeah okay yeah sure i, I, guess. I think <laughs> anytime you anytime you give the terminator like a solid like metal framework even underneath the liquid metal it's, it's like a compromise it's not going to be as like good at sneaking into places and like what why does it need to have like built in weaponry? Like if it can like kill people with like forming knives or hammers or whatever, like that's that's fine for what it needs to do, and then it can just procure any weapons that it needs. So yeah, I, like you guys said, um once you got to T two, you you'd essentially got the ultimate form of the Terminator and anything else was gonna be a downgrade and fucking dark fate just went full retard where it's like well it can split into two terminators and that makes it more efficient like i don't know how about you just send two like t1000s back then it's like well so yeah that's the problem that's probably the biggest arguably will building problem of all the terminator films is that you just have to buy that's a really strange plan from the terminators and doesn't you like did you have no other options could you not send loads because if this is your final plan you may as well just fucking spam them dude send them all back <laughs> like but why not i think it would be funny for t2 like they finally like <laughs> shoot the, the t the t1000 into the liquid metal and then another one just spawns in immediately like oh, oh shit. <laughs> I, I think that two had better ways of like slowing it down though because if he shotgunned him in the chest he'd have to wait for it to heal before he could yeah. move on whereas yeah. in the third one he's smashing her into toilets and you're like well you're a liquid what is a toilet gonna do to you you know it's not really gonna <laughs> slow you down much and so well, even thing, when you're then, smashing her through buildings, you're like, but it's not going to damage her in any way. And I think you, after a few films, you get to a point where you're going to have to come up with some kind of reason or like advance the plot forward on why are you um, even doing this in the first place? If it's not just to get her off your car and you want to run, what is the point of actually smashing her into this stuff? Something I love about Terminator 2 is the every fight that the T-1000 has with the T, well, just with Arnie at that point, they mostly just get away from him before he kills us every mm. single time until they they can't run anymore and he has to fight him and he fucking loses pretty hard like you know before the rest happens i just um i really like that because uh you made him terrifying um 
the lady robot was just is she just felt odd to me in that movie. I need to rewatch it to be more specific than that, but um I think we kind of talked about I didn't like what do you guys think about future John Connor when he no longer has a war to fight becomes like a crazy drug addict man who's trying to live by breaking into places and getting access to pills. I I just I was like nah, I don't think so. I mean, I, you could debate like the the effect that that would have on you psychologically. You know, thinking like you're going to be the future leader of humanity, and you you've got this in, enormous weight of responsibility put on you, and then suddenly it's been removed, and you don't have that anymore. Like, what do you like? Turn the thing your is, life he towards? removed it. He fought to remove that in a sense. And do you, do you know yeah. about that like uh, original ending that T two was going to have? Yeah. Where he's like well, a senator or something. Yeah, but like, like without talking about whether or not it's cheesy to flash forward to the future, I could totally believe that he would go into politics instead, or he would maybe into the military, something like that. I mean, he's... It's a tricky one, because like when you see John Connor in T2, he's a troubled child. You know, he's obviously been fucked up by like the, the kind of life that his mom's put him through, uh, and the knowledge of what's lying ahead for him in the future, and like he doubts whether or not she's like true like whether she's been telling the truth or she's just a crazy person um so i can kind of i can see how that would mess him up to the point where like when it's all over he just devolves into yeah you, know, you know drugs and and crime and stuff like i don't really have a purpose in my life because this thing that was meant to be laid out for me doesn't exist anymore so why do i even why am i even here what's my meaning in life the fundamental one, so. question you have to ask when you look at a John Connor character, and this is the first thing a casting director should ask is, is this person believable as a great leader? Can you look at this person and think, yes, I can see that person being a great leader in the future? And Edward Furlong, sure, because you know he was just a kid at the time and he had charisma and he had personality and he, and he had edge, so you could see it. Um, but then with, uh, with T3, no, it doesn't really work. It's like you look at that guy and you just think, okay, I, I don't see him standing in a room of 200 soldiers and inspiring them prior to a battle. And then you get to Dark Fate and it's just this little Latina girl. And it's like, yeah, that was just, there's, there's, they try to do it. They give her these, uh, this kind of ropey haircut. And they, there's a scene where she, she goes outside and she does this and all these dudes. And it's, it's so cringe. Them doing their best Even, yeah. to make her look like a leader. And it just, it's, it's actually laughable. They did a little bit where she goes like, "Well, fuck fate." Yeah, <laughs> they did a flash forward scene for Nick Stahl as uh, as John as well because they always that, that was like T three was like when it started becoming iterative. That's the the problem we used to have. Where it was like, "We got to do T two again, but let's find a way." And it's just like they send it back a little bit later and it's going to do the whole story again. Why not? The one thing they did better than recasting her or fucking assassinating her character was just going. Sarah died. <laughs> you're like okay yep. i'll take that fine <laughs> just fucking rescue it but my uh, issue with I mean, my issue with going to the future in in the first place is that it kind of doesn't make sense unless you're already if it's in another movie right so like if you're going through the present that future is your future with what you're going to do so flashing forward in a movie kind of makes sense that's the threat that you're trying to prevent all of your actions have a point because you're desperately trying to stop this thing if you just do a movie on its own in the future, you're like, well, which future? Because, like, we've already changed the past. So which one of these is that? And if somebody does an action in another movie, this one gets wiped out of existence and the entire movie is pointless in the first place. And so I didn't really want to see a movie just about the future on its own. Um, I would have preferred self-contained previous ones with flash forwards if you feel they needed to, to that if you thought it could enhance something of how they got to this position in the first place yeah but i i kind of i get what you're saying like t like terminator salvation was just very much more a sci-fi war movie than any kind of like real terminator um you know it didn't have the tenets of a terminator movie yeah. where it's like the whole future of of the world hangs in the balance and it's going to be decided by you know a bunch of people with scrappy weapons like fighting it out in the present day and like that's that's not what it became. It became like this big, like sort of saving Private Ryan kind of war movie. Um, but they tried to they tried to maintain like a little foothold in that time traveling element with uh, with Marcus and and um, you know that character who's like yeah. from the present day and he's brought forward into the future. And it just felt unnecessary. It's like just commit to it if you're gonna do it. Um, well, they fuck with yeah, the timeline I... too, and John points it out. I think at seven points in the film, he's like, "They're making these models too early. Like, this isn't how it goes." And he talks about it. Uh, oh, and obviously, like he's 
set to die. I, I can't remember if they try and argue that's the normal timeline and that Marcus changes it by giving him his heart. It might be, yeah, because in T3, like the, the Terminator that sent back then is like, yeah, I'm the one who killed you in the future. Yeah. I thought that's what they were trying to drag forward was keeping that with T3. Which is so funny, by the way, that like the idea that T4 may have respected T3 enough to be like, okay, we'll make that canon, we'll continue with it. And then I think they, it, I Tim think Miller. They tried to, yeah. Yeah, the, I think Tim Miller said, like, fuck the shitty films. We're decanonizing Genesis 4 and 3. Out they go. We'll keep 1 and 2. Even 2 is kind of thrown out. And then he, he ends up apologizing for the film. Like, <laughs> like it's yeah. just. Yeah. I'm waiting for the next Terminator to come out. It's just going to be fucking shit again. It, it wouldn't leave it alone. Life comes at you hard, doesn't it, Tim? <laughs> you know? <laughs> They're not going to do any more. Well, Arnold's not going to be involved in any more. I think he said that publicly. It's like, I don't want to do any more Terminator movies. Yeah, because they didn't so do crap. a bar instead. <laughs> yeah, I, I watched the first episode of that. I'm not feeling it. It gets worse. She gets worse, specifically. Right. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at Arnold in that, and it's like, oh, you're, you're looking really frail now. I, I don't think you should be doing this stuff anymore. Just, just retire, oh. Arnold. It's not no, necessarily it's... very believable when he's he's riding in a, a fire truck, and then he jumps from the fire truck onto the street, and he tries to do a stunt roll, and it's like, obviously it's yeah. a stunt man, but you sort of think, I, I, I have trouble believing that this man is, is capable of that kind of physicality. Cause well, that's because it's see, not really about him. It's about her and her teaching him all the errors of his ways. And she's more amazing than his. She can fight better than he can. She's more intelligent Wait. than him. She's literally the, the perfect example of a Mary Sue. And she's determined to keep telling him that that's what she is over and over What's again. What's the premise of the show? Um, it's supposed to be, was it True Lies that he did? It's supposed to be like a modern version of that-ish as a so basis. So he's like a CIA guy. Daughter. Yeah, he's, he was about to retire, and like he gets called back for one last mission. And, like, it's like a Liam Neeson movie, except it's a TV show. Yeah. Because uh, we'll yeah, they did Arnold, a True Lies TV show. <laughs> Nobody <Arnold> saw it. Just... <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, he just looks kind of tired and like, I don't know. Like, Stallone, when he did uh, Tulsa King, like he still looks like he can kick ass. Like He's still in pretty good shape. Like Arnold just very much looks his age. He's, he's an older man now, and uh, I just don't think he should be doing this anymore. He's not capable of that physicality now. Um, but, well, I, I love how we've gone on, on this crazy tangent talking about the Terminator movies for like the past 20 minutes. It's <laughs> great. Drinker, it's a trauma. Yeah, was it supposed to be Lord of the Rings? How did we even get here? It's yeah, a who cares? Like, I'd much rather talk about either. Terminator than, than fucking Rings of Power. Fuck Although in all show. seriousness, is is Rings of Power salvageable? I mean, obviously they rejected no. my proposal for it, but other than that, is it salvageable? <laughs> I loved your idea. Just make idea a fucking an entirely fake show for Jennifer Salky to just like <laughs> obsess over. Yeah, trying to make arcs. the actual show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, discussing Urukai discussing their pronouns. Yeah. Um, I like to think it's always salvageable, but you need to fire everyone <laughs> and maybe start from but, there. Like, can you make Galadriel likable at this point? Like, yeah, but we'll just, we'll just gut your it. main like, character. Basically ignore, well, not ignore everything that's happened. Start making her have consequences. This is the same thing I think we talked about with uh, Captain Marvel. You need to maintain, uh, you know, briefly, what they've done and just start having consequences hit them as characters and have people actually dislike them in-universe as a result of their fucking attitudes. Have them actually lose things and then be like, man, maybe I shouldn't be an asshole, huh? So what you're saying mm. is, if we can kill Caliborn, we can kill Galadriel. <laughs> Let's just kill everyone. <laughs> that, yeah. That'll fix it. That'll fix it. It's just, um, yeah, I think there's so much dislike towards this show now. Um, like, all the actors are, are, are going to be associated with those shitty characters. I just don't think you can salvage that. I, you might be able to salvage it from a storytelling point of view, maybe, but like in terms of fan goodwill and stuff, like yeah, you're not gonna pull this one back. No, yeah, it's it's going down, and it's going way further down. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, the, the culture hasn't changed as well. The, what they really needed was a cultural shift. They needed um, Jeff Bezos or somebody else who has the power in Amazon to say, okay, look, just get rid of Jennifer Salke. She's not working out for us. We need to shift gears in the whole production. But there's no cultural change whatsoever. We were saying it earlier. They have therapists on set. They're going to do all-female directors. So without, without a, a change in the culture of Amazon Studios, 
nothing's going to happen. It's going to be the same crap. It might not be as bad. They might bring in some professional writers and some people with experience to make it a bit more watchable. But fundamentally, the core problems are still going to be there. And you still have that that soft, pussy-ish culture that, that just saturates the entire studio. And it's going to bleed into the production. And it's going to be basically the same build just season one, I would, I would expect. I think everyone expects that. Yeah. Um, Wasn't it Rings what, of Power that was bragging that it had was it either all female writers or all female directors? Directors, that, Rings like, of Power. What we're saying, yeah. So they they yeah. it it's not that oh we could fix it if we have better people. It's like no, they're still virtue signaling exactly the same. That's what surprised me actually that the actors are still coming out with the same marketing material that they had for season one. And I, if we, I recently, <laughs> if I, we I went push back it hard watched, enough, eventually it will work. Yeah. I mean, I went back and watched the Superfans video, and they are use it. They they say the exact same lines, the same terminology as all of the casted in the marketing material later. And so uh, it's like if you just repeat it, this is now be the third time they've repeated it. I think like, well, it's it still doesn't work. Einstein's definition. I, well, I don't, don't know about you, Disparu. I want to get into the queer gender fluid themes of Gondor. Uh, <laughs> you know, Earth, so Who doesn't? I'm, I'm excited to to hear all about that. I'm sure they're going to have great <laughs> stuff for us. Um. Should we do a few super chats? Since we're here well, and there's many I of them propose. waiting for us. All right. Well, I'm sure that for like we're all going to have something to pitch in on this one because I'm, I'm sure most of them for the the bar itself. So I will launch in. Uh, Don Blackbird says uh, this will be number one hundred in the open bar playlist. Nice. Well, Ooh. there you go. We we you're the first one that we got there. So nice one. Elsie um, Le Pen says. Want to see Chris Hemsworth's uh, I'll Come Back for Something Unique next to Harrison Ford's It's Not Fun, It's Work. Actors in the MCU sound fucking miserable. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. can't argue with that, really. Like, yeah. Um, didn't uh, Taika Waititi came out with an interesting quote recently when he was talking about I'll be obsolete in 10 years. Um, and he, he drew the comparison of like nobody remembers the director of Casablanca. Like, they remember the movie, they just don't remember the guy who directed it. Most people, anyway. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm going to do this charitably and say he was he was almost making fun of his own body of work and saying, like, well, I'm, I'm, I haven't produced a Casablanca in my life, so I'm probably going to be obsolete in my own lifetime. And he's right. He probably is. This is what happens when you make homogenized corporate trash as your main movies. Although if you're a director working in Hollywood and you're not making homogenized corporate trash, like, are you even working? <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Um, um, I'm hoping we're coming to the end of this period in our lives or in Hollywood's life. I feel um, like someone's going to clip that and play it to you in 50 years when you're on your yeah. deathbed. And you'll be like, oh, how fucking oh, wrong I was. <laughs> you sweet summer child drinker. <laughs> even with Thor, though, with Taika Waititi's interview that he did with um, one of the cast... They start taking the piss out of the CGI that one of the characters doesn't look very good. And then he goes, one of the things that you'll want to see, but you won't realize it, is Thor going through a midlife crisis. And you're like, even you don't believe that? And I could, you could see on the screen that you do not believe that this is what people want. It's like when the writer of S.H.I.E.L.D. went, well, what people want to see is a legal drama about paperwork. It's like, everyone, everyone in that room just went, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be good. It's, they, they know they're making crap when they're making it. It's just, I get paid, though. Do I really care? Yeah, get that paycheck. Did um, you see that clip of Taika, by the way, uh, related to the strike? Um, it went around the internet a little bit. He was at a stage, he was supposed to give a, a speech, and he's uh, he's like making some really awkward jokes that aren't landing very well. And then uh, he's like, I got some, got some bullet points to read. Hope you guys don't mind that, do you? And then there's like some giggles, and he's like, good. Um, hmm. Looking forward to when this strike is over. But as a member of the writing, you know, I, I, I want us to get what we want to get as well. Oof. It's like that it, like, meme where it's like up on, like doing the stand up comedy act. It's like, you suck, and all his notes are just like, um... <laughs> the same act. Oh, Listen to it, I was like, doing? holy fuck, this is awkward as hell. Like, I'm not even sure what he's going for, if anything in particular, or he's just drunk or something, but it, it comes across like he's annoyed that people are striking which is possibly the worst look he can take right now for people who like him. Because I'm not a huge fan of his work right now, <laughs> nor am I a fan of his attitudes, but a lot of people are, 
If you, I was looking at the threads on it, people were like, it's fucking disgusting. He should be treating this much more seriously. The strike is incredibly important, all that sort of stuff. I was just like, damn. I was very confused. I don't know what's going on there. Hmm. Um, well, I don't think he's going to go down as one of the great forces in Hollywood um, when we look back on his career, put it that way. Um, yeah. But on the plus side, Gopher Broke says that Gollum won the argument. I think Gollum <laughs> won everything, really. Like, greatest game of the year. <laughs> can we, we show the clip? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Have you got it? You can share it with Hang us. On. It should I be can, able to find I it. Pop it up. I do have yeah, to thank you, Mola, for making Az play that game. I've oh, had yeah. hours of fun just wanting. And, and I, he looks as if he's a man on the verge of collapse, but it's been <laughs> so funny to watch. I can't believe well, I he's actually going today. through the whole game. <laughs> yeah, the man has he, lost his mind so many times. I was talking to him about this today, and he was like, I, I don't understand why people like me playing this, but like, I've had like the biggest audience ever <laughs> of me like, playing a game. I haven't been able to stop. Yeah, Dude, it's, my it's, first it's such garbage. Stream, I had 2,800 people watching me play. I was like, why are you all here? <laughs> it's a <laughs> broken ass game. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see if I can bring this up. Okay. Uh... When you're done with that one, go on my profile and play the other one. The fucking... They're both classic. This, 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 for anyone who doesn't know, this is Gollum, the recent video game that was released in the Lord of the Rings fucking selection of video games. No, I don't know why this was made. Nobody does. They decided they were going to make a Lord of the Rings game and they would make it about you playing as Gollum running around Mordor. But um, they didn't have much time or money, apparently. And they released something that's become one of the most memeable games just ever it's incredibly broken and hilarious um and lacks in basically every aspect you could imagine for a video game and so i've been streaming it as has been streaming it uh and a couple of others and, and it has paywalls time. i'll see if it, i can add this in no uh, yeah it's probably worth mentioning uh as you're doing that they paywalled um the law you can't read <laughs> law from the game unless you uh pay Another thing they made paywalled was having the elves speak elvish. You have to pay to get that. And then the final thing that people should know is that you have to pay extra money in order to have Gollum say, my precious. <laughs> right, should we play it and we can, we can get Metal's reaction to this? Yes. When I saw Az playing, uh, one of these wheels was turning on its side, so it wasn't even yeah. rotating properly. It's so it's so sad to see it happening. Oh no! Oh, he's gonna break his arms. <laughs> oh, okay, no. he's just dislocated both his shoulders. Oh no! This is the Exorcist. I find this quite relaxing. It, it looks like he's practicing some far eastern martial art. You know that really relaxed Hong Kong martial art they do, where it's all slow movement. Oh, what, what just happened oh, no, to it's him? It's gotten worse. I, 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 oh. <laughs> He's possessed. <laughs> it's the exorcist now. But with Gollum. The metal's just lost his mind on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just uh, if you go on my profile, it's uh, the other clip that's there. It's the one that is, is it illustrates something about the uh, death boxes that they drew in the game. For anyone who's not familiar, that just means places where you go in the map that it'll automatically kill you because you've gone too far out of it. Sometimes... Uh, is this from, for like, 23 hours ago or something? Yeah, it's, it's the only other clip there. It should just be Do right you just now. drop oh, yeah, dead, yeah, 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 or does yeah. it just transport you back to the start point? Uh, sometimes it actually does teleport you back, but a lot of the time it'll just kill you. But the thing is, they haphazardly placed a lot of them. So some of them you'll find, you know, the second you fall off any ledge, you'll go dead straight away. And it's like, oh... That's, that's a bit of a, you know, but you, you, it's like, well, I would have been dead anyway, so fine. But some of them are in placements that you wouldn't expect. And uh, I, I made a clip of one of them. If, if uh... Uh, Yeah, I'll just bring it up now. So, uh, right, here we go. I saw as where a grenade was lobbed onto, like, the same general floor as him. And wherever he ran on this floor, the, the explosion still killed him. And he didn't even know why or where he was supposed to be going. <laughs> I'll bring this back. <laughs> oh, I hate his jump. Yeah, you don't really need the volume for it anyway. Just look what happens. I'm trying to get on the boxes to the right there. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> I had that. I, well, I did have something like that happen in. Um, I, I did have something like that happen in the Dead Space remake, where uh, like there's there's a bit where you're in this like chamber where there's like a big rotating centrifuge, uh, yeah. big rotating centrifuge thing, and um, yeah, like just have to turn around after flicking a switch, happened to walk into it just as it was spinning, and like. There was this moment of like pausing, and then my character just disintegrated on screen for no yeah. reason. Like just <laughs> chunks of them went everywhere. I was like, it's one of those oh, things. Okay. Like if you touch the centrifuge, you are dead. It's like well, that wouldn't have killed me though. It's like shut up, you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Even the jumping though, I saw as at one, but he's looking. His screen is looking this way. The arms going this way. He's like, I want to jump over there. I want to jump on that ledge. Jump on that ledge. And he's like screaming at this point because he's died so many times on the ledge. I want to jump over. And the character just jumps straight up in the air. Falls yeah. to his death, <laughs> like just <laughs> falls in his head. Was oh, that released with day fuck. one? Was Gollum released with a day one patch? It's it was released with a fucking day one apology. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lord of Ring. They yeah. called it Lord of Ring Gollum. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make that, that shit up, man. Best one ever. Uh, Andrew McCarthy says, uh, "Cheers." Is Futurama any good? I mean, I it alternates it between fantastic. good and. Yeah, I mean, it does... Season 1, 2, 3, 4, you get the movies are... Um, I think two of them are pretty damn solid, two of them are more shaky. Then, is it season... Would it be considered season 5 or 6 at that point? It's like a mixed bag, the whole thing, but I really mm -hmm. like how it ends. The revival show that's coming, I wouldn't hold your breath. That's all I've got to say on that one. Yeah. Now, the early no. seasons of Futurama are excellent. Oh, I love but them. I, ne I never watched... Yeah, they're brilliant. My two favorite sh animated shows are The Simpsons and Futurama. Hell and yeah. yeah, the early stuff. Oh, hail Calculon! Is awesome. <laughs> oh, Calculon's great. Uh, I did. I never watched the Calculon. revival though. Never watched the later stuff. The the. Um, I mean, uh, I would recommend. It. It's worth going through. You'll find a lot in there that you'll really like. It's um, it also starts to. You wonder if it's going to turn into Simpsons, where it just never ends as a zombie of a show. But they end it, and I think it has a good ending, which is kind of unfortunate for how it's coming back again. Yeah, I hope it's good. Uh, Kedge64 says, Greetings, everyone. Also, Drinker, when will you be playing Gollum? You'll have fun with it. Uh, just ask Mauler. Well, I mean, if those clips are anything to go by, I'd have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, looks great fun. Um, I just don't know if my, my setup is going to be enough to handle it, because apparently it's it's pretty intensive. Well, Jay Longbone put it on all lowest, and she couldn't stream it. <laughs> Jesus. Oh. It's, it's horribly optimized. Is it uh, 60 GB? It requires on your computer. Uh, I'm not sure how much space it requires. But what I know is that um, like uh, it, it's it's massive the the amount of space that it requires. I did see uh, a stream on it, it and it, it takes it, it's seventy dollars. I'm not gonna fucking buy the thing, but I've seen streams <laughs> and uh, it's yeah, it's not optimized. It requires a massive amount of space. I'm pretty sure the specs, like running it at 1080, 60 FPS or something like that, was uh, you need a 30, 70. Like that's what it's recommended. It was just like you, f <laughs> like what? <Yeah. laughs> and they're just like, yeah, you know, <laughs> we're sorry. And then, like, you, you get the clips that like what as showed today, where it's like they've got fucking sprites in the background. It's like, <laughs> how does this need a 30, 70 to run it? It's, oh no, it's fucked. It's completely fucked. And the thing is, like, it's so hard to feel any sympathy for their little apology. Like, we know you guys want a good experience. It's like, it's a, why'd you release it? <laughs> Look at that thing. <laughs> it's horrible. The thing is, even if they fixed all the problem, like all the bugs, it'd still be a bad game. And yes. I know, I'm not even sure how you'd make a good game out of Gollum. Even when it was Gone. announced to it, the trailer, I'm like, this looks awful. This looks like a really bad idea. And it came you out know, uh, exactly how it looks. The game has you know, its own yeah, yeah, yeah. Odd world, yeah. It, it, odd world, Abe's Odyssey. Like you could have done it kind of in that vein, but you would do a modern, uh, you know, fully three D, fully immersive version. But it would be something like that. I thought that that's where they were going to draw their inspiration yeah, from. Uh, yeah, Gollum. No. To help people understand that game, Gollum as it stands, because I completely agree with Dispro. I assume this is what you're trying to say that if they were to get rid of all bugs, iron it out completely, it's a shit game. It'll be boring yeah. as hell. There's barely anything you can do in it. You can hang on ledges and climb up on them. You can climb ladders. You can open, well, not even open doors. I think you just go through doors. <laughs> I can't remember if you even open doors. It's the worst you... parts of Assassin's Creed, the game. There's nothing in it. It's it's almost a walking simulator. Um, and it's actually an embarrassment. It, like, it, But it's also incredibly broken. You know, you, if you watch As or myself or anyone else stream it, 
what you'll find is that we're waiting for the game to break because everything else is boring as sin. Like you have to wait for people to talk, wait to just walk around, wait. It's, sometimes NPCs get stuck. And you're just like, great. <laughs> As is like reset chapters because he loses control over the fucking character. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was awesome. He just couldn't move. And you're like, okay, I'll just reload it. It, it saved the fact that he couldn't move. And so we had yeah. to restart the entire level. <laughs> it's a game that hates him and, well, existence, I guess. It's kind of mutual then, I suppose, after a point. Um <laughs> Okay, uh, Cirrhosis of Liver says, Cheers, lads. I've been watching Disparu review Gotham Knights, a show of low-effort writing. I put more effort into taking a shit after a night of Taco Bell washed down with a gallon of gin. That was just the reviews. <laughs> I, um, yep. I finished watching episode 8 last night, Disparu. I'm catching Ooh. up, I'm catching up. I'm like the only other person on the internet who's watching that show as well as you. Oh, the last one. It's like, I don't know much about radiation. But as you exist throughout reality, you kind of pick up a bit about alpha and gamma radiation. But it was like the last one was custom designed to piss me off as every <laughs> single the, the small amount of radiation of uh, information about radiation i did know they are exactly the opposite of correct every single time and i was more annoyed than that than them crapping on batman which they seem to love doing every episode oh, now yeah. oh uh, they're, they're so annoyed we did get a solution shite. to the love quadrilateral though so that matters like, out of all the TV shows we've had this year, sort of Velma, Mandalorian Season 3, Cleopatra, if you had, had to suffer through that, and uh, this one we're discussing now, where does it fall? Like, is it the worst? Is, is it the second worst? Is, it, is, there, is there anything it's better than? The fact that all of those are in the same list is like, Jesus Christ. I know, the issue I with it is, year. Yeah. the issue with it is there's a lot of things which are bad, but they're entertainingly bad. Like, Willow was bad, but it was hilarious. And I found it really fun to, like, talk about. This is just like, it, it, it's not bad enough to be funny. It's just bad and boring and everything's horrible. Yeah. And so I feel like the way As looks playing Gollum is how I feel watching that show. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way I can describe it. Whereas That's I really cute. enjoyed Willow and She-Hulk. I thought She-Hulk was also entertainingly bad. This one, it, it's not there. The first episode, that was, and then it kind of improved a bit and got, that makes it worse. Because it's not funny anymore. Yeah. I actually yeah. had a better time watching Velma than I did Mandalorian Season 3. Because although yes. Velma's a worse show, mm. and, it's, and it's disgusting and it's evil, um, it's actually, you can kind of hate watch it and, and you can be amused at the ridiculous levels mm. of yes. propagandization and just playing woke throughout the show. It, it It's so bad that it sort of exists on a level of ironic enjoyment. It's still very boring. But The Mandalorian is just unwatchably boring it's it's the worst thing i've seen since at least rings of power it's not a pleasant watch definitely um kedge says uh, also the super mario brothers movie is now the third highest grossing animated film uh, right now behind frozen 2 and the lion king remake it'll be one hell of a victory for nintendo if the film does become number one i mean i think it's already a massive victory like this is uh, like been a very successful film I think they should all feel pretty happy with how it's done. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be many more to come after that. You know, it's uh, it's taken what the Sonic movies did and like, you know, taken that way beyond. Like it's far more successful financially than they were. Um, but it's good stuff, I suppose. Um, Wayland Vasefis says, Austrian painter or Black Aragorn? Which would you pick? <laughs> I think we know what you're talking about there. <laughs> um, neither, neither one is good. Um, Joshua Levesque, that's one of my mods here, says, Hail to you, legends. Uh, Drinker, please use this money to bribe Tatiana onto the show. I can't let her out of her cage. She'll just try and escape, you know? I, just, I told you about this. Uh, also, always remember, Star Trek is just Star Wars without the Force. Oh, Who was it that said that again? That was the e <laughs> Oh, yeah. We covered someone who said that when you take the Force out of Star Wars, all you have left is Battlestar Galactica or Star Trek or, you know, Stargate or, or fucking The Expanse. It was like, what? Have you ever watched any of these shows? None of those shows are similar, like, at all. It was just this implication that all of them shows are the same. All they lack is the Force. <laughs> like, I mean, if what? spaceships in, I suppose. <laughs> if that's how you want to think about it. It's like when there. people go, it's a first-person shooter. They're all the same. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Grimnax says, happy corporate pandering month, everyone. Uh, I'm still waiting on that Race Walk Tarzan live-action movie. Do it, Disney. <laughs> no balls. <laughs> yeah, give it time. They actually um, did a Tarzan live-action remake in, I think it was 1993. 
Yeah, was it Brit? No, was it Brendan Fraser? Are we talking about no. George of the Jungle? No, no, not yeah, George. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a Tarzan George's... remake. <laughs> they got. Oh, have wait. you ever seen? No, it was it Christopher Lambert that was in that. Have you ever seen the Bruce Lee movie? That it's a, it's a from like the nineties. It's a bio biopic of Bruce Lee. You seen that? No. Uh, well, it's the same actor that plays Bruce Lee. He's Tarzan. Um, it's from ninety three. I don't think it was very successful, but I've never seen it. But it's it's already been done. Okay. Um... Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess it's one of those things that they're always going to be doing things. Um, hold on, I'm just scrolling up here. Shit, where is it? Lost my place for a moment. Okay, we'll just okay. be perfectly silent and like. Yeah, yeah. Wait until you find yeah, everything. Yeah, oh yeah, here it goes. Uh, <laughs> JS Pena says, "Gentlemen, on this day one year ago was the day that we will all remember as the day Amber Heard almost caught Jack Captain Jack Sparrow." Yeah, it didn't work out too well for her. I think she's taking a break from Hollywood, hasn't she? She's mm -hmm. uh, she's in exile. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, look, what will she give it like two, three years before she does her big comeback? I, I would say so. She'll she'll probably want to come back to this once she she's got more money to make, and well, at this point she's got debt, so she, she has to pay off. So she'll she'll Can be back though, eventually. I mean... The normal grift for that kind of stuff is like, oh, well, everyone's sexist, and I think we need to open up more roles for uh, people who aren't objectified and stuff. I don't think she can really go that angle, like a lot of the other Hollywood stars. Yeah. Um, here's one for everyone. Waylon Becepha says, Rings of Power or She-Hulk? Have a good one, gents. Mm, Which one would you she pick? She-Hulk quicker. Yeah. Yeah. If someone put a gun to my head and forced me to rewatch one of them, I'd rewatch She Hulk just because it's faster. In terms of which one's the better show, I would say Rings of Power isn't as bad as She Hulk. I, I think because I care more about the source material for Rings of Power than I do for She Hulk, and so I might be more inclined to watch that. But yeah, I think objectively, Rings of Power is probably a better show overall. <laughs> but yeah. She Hulk one. is shorter, it's very densely yeah. packed. Like the the bad stuff comes at you every few like few seconds. <laughs> it gets all the stupid out pretty quickly. There is My reviews of Shield went on for an hour on a twenty two minute show. <laughs> yeah. uh, Living Jar Cletus says, "Nice tan drinker. If you get any darker, you might find yourself cast as the next Aragorn." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to say. Like, it's uh, we we get like a little bit of sunshine in Scotland, um, and when it happens, yeah, I seem to tan quite quickly or get sunburned. One of the two. Um, RRTNZ says, "Hail drinker and panel, loved you and Despot's Cleopatra takes." Uh, question: What's everyone's favorite film montage? For me, it's uh, OG Predator. Cheers and R R I P Calculon. So yeah, favorite movie montages. For us guys, um, Rocky montages are always legends. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Rock. My favorite's actually Rocky Three because it's Apollo Creed. He's trying to whip him into shape. I always loved that. I like Rocky Four just because it's so over the top ridiculous. You've got like Rocky <laughs> lifting an entire like horse and cart with all his friends in it. Like, ah, um, it's just yeah, it's uh, it's very Rocky Four, like very mid eighties. Uh, I'll go with uh, Team America when he's prepping with Spotswood to uh, save the team, you know, and they <laughs> make fun of montages. <laughs> I don't have, it's not a favorite movie montage, but it's a TV montage from Stargate SG-1 where they're in a time loop. And so they keep reliving the same day over and over again. And there's a bit where the, the episode was too short. So they just ad-libbed and improvised a whole montage of different things, like playing golf, the kissing Samantha Carter and everything. And you see the wacky things they do when they take a few loops off. Um, it's funny as hell. Because, like, Teal'c has to start every loop by getting hit in the face with a door. Yes! <laughs> and so, like, yeah. uh, initially he's like, oh, you've apologized many times. One day I won't be so forgiven. And then one time he just fucking destroys the guy. <laughs> and he walks like, away with this, like, smirk on his face. <laughs> he's making, like, faces on his... Um on his plate and everything. They're playing golf through the Stargate, and the, the guy comes down and starts screaming at him. It's awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's quite good. It's quite good when they just have a bit of fun with stuff like that. <clears throat> um, Dragon... Sorry, Dragonic Ice Mage says, Evening all, have any of you bought, played, read, or watched something out of morbid curiosity? Mine was the comic from last week. I guess one of Mauler's is the infamous Lord of the Rings game. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah I guess that counts. <laughs> Velma, probably. I have more of a curiosity because I didn't go into it expecting it to be good. And uh, wow, I was not disappointed. Don't know if you guys have anything. I mean, I watched all of Velma because I was I, I did I did a proposal for season two of Velma, which again was rejected. But um, in terms of morbid curiosity, yeah, yeah, Velma is one of those shows you kind of have to see to believe. Definitely. Also, that that song we were discussing. If you're if anyone is feeling masochistic today and uh, they're morbidly curious, they can listen to the uh, the seagull song, the Aquafina song from The Little Mermaid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. God. I don't think I've ever seen a TV show that was as, like, blatantly malicious as Valma. Like, that was something that hated people, and it wanted you to know it. Um, and the enti- that was the entire point of the show. And it was called a comedy, it was called everything. It's like, no, this, this actually just hates people. Um, and it seems to even hate the very source material itself. And uh, I'm, I'm not even sure we'll get another TV show like that. That's, I, I still think that's about a peak as we're ever going to go. Everything else is a bit more mask on kind of thing. Um, mm. But the fact that that got a season, like, people kept saying it was two seasons already that got split in half. Ugh. I, I dread to think what I'm going to do in the second. If that I'll was tell the you one thing that, I, that I am really... <laughs> one thing I am really curious about is Caligula. Um, Cannes Film Festival have... There was a re-edit of a 1970s movie. 1979, uh, Caligula. Malcolm McDowell, the same guy who was in Clockwork Orange, he's, he was in it, and it was a, apparently a legendarily bad, disgusting gross and massively over sexualized movie and people were really disgusted at it when it came out at the time but apparently this director has done a re-edit of it and he says no there's there's really good stuff here and he released this re-edit at the Cannes Film Festival and it's been really well received so if you're feeling like genuinely curious and you, you just want to watch something for kind of like a grotesque effect or to give you a weird emotional reaction maybe check out Caligula from 1979 one of the one of the more notorious films of history I've I've seen bits of it, like the, like where he invented this like machine with like spinning blades on it, and it would just like slice people's heads off and stuff. Like, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a gory movie, but I'd be interested to see a recut version of that to see what they could do with it. I suppose because um, there were, when you read into the history of it, it's quite amazing. There were, it's like eighty hours of footage was filmed. The whole production was just one gigantic mess. Um. But yeah, I'll be interested to see what he did because they did have so much footage for it. Malcolm McDowell's an interesting actor as well. Like, absolutely, like, you know, crazy intense, like, uh, you know, method acting back in the 70s and, you know, like doing like Clockwork Orange and all that sort of stuff. And then just kind of devolved into like low grade, you know, B movie garbage in the. Yeah, he's in shit tons 90s. of random shit. Yeah. And it's just kind of a shame. Like, he's like pretty, pretty good actor back in the day. Yeah, the singing in the rain, like uh, his character doing singing in the rain during the torture scene in Clockwork Orange was his idea, and Kubrick went along with it. Mm. No, that's, uh, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, Angry Batman says, uh, odd question, but what made you have Drake as a CIA operative instead of MI6? Love the books either way. Interesting question. So this is Ryan Drake's the main character in my novels. Um, he was originally going to be American. Um, in my first draft of the script, but uh, my British publisher wanted a British protagonist, funnily enough, and so I had to make this weird halfway house where he's uh, he's actually British, and then he ends up working for the CIA because he's like a contractor for them, so that's kind of how it came about. Originally, he was going to be just an American working for the CIA, but uh, mm. yeah, that's the demands of the publishing industry, I suppose. Uh, Waylon Bicephus says, anyone else think that Christopher Nolan is overrated? Um... Mauler, over to you. <laughs> Why would you say that? He's go- he made my favorite movie of all time. So, yeah, the you think prestige. he's kept that me. level of uh, quality throughout his career. Um, you know, that that was what two thousand. I was going to say two thousand six. Oh, I'm forgetting it feels this. Feels like yeah, mid two thousands. So that wasn't exactly yesterday. Um, he has since made several films that I consider interesting or questionable at times. You know, and hey, Oppenheimer, that's coming. Maybe that'll um, be great. I'm gonna watch it. Has anyone like seen it. Tenet? I haven't. Yeah. Has I, I'm, I'm actually. Has anybody here seen Tenet? Yeah, we've seen it. What did you, you sound think? Really enthusiastic. It's a bit shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very like uh, it's all very intellectualized and very high concept stuff, but it's just missing the whole like plot, character, I've, and uh, like, interesting character arcs thing. Yeah, I've entertainment. Heard. Yeah. 
that what you need to do is you not you stop trying to understand it. You need to feel it. That's that's what I've heard. Which I, is a I, great I sign. For, I would settle for just being able to hear it. <laughs> That'd be nice. Just gotta feel it. It's an experience. Fucking soundtrack, honestly. Damn. Yeah. But um, um yeah. what do you guys think? What do you think? What's what's the feel on Nolan in the room, huh? I think that it, for a director to be able to do distinctive work and to make at least very good films in, well, when, when you could say the modern Hollywood era, that sort of started in 2015. But, I mean, his best, all of his best stuff is a, a while ago. We'll see what happens with Oppenheimer. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, he, he's beginning to feel like a director who uh, is, has passed his, his best. To me, that's, that's what I would say. And I do think he's done some excellent stuff. His best movie is probably Memento. Uh, what do you think, Disbury? See, I'm I'm torn. I, I've I've saw Memento, and the more I think about it, the more I'm like, this is just a gimmick. <laughs> That's all Ooh. it is. It's not really pushing boundaries. It's literally it literally relies on a gimmick and being complex. And yeah, if you watch if you watch that, like, you, there's obviously cuts where people are like, I've rearranged it into the set in the right order. It's like it's 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 not that big a deal. It, it is the delivery. And you'd be like, yeah, okay, you get points for originality. Uh, I don't really care, though. I want to be, if you, you want to be purely entertained rather than come away thinking, that was weird. Uh, <laughs> then I'm not really sure what the guess that. No, I do like um, Dark Knight. Um, that kind of, that's one of my favorite movies, probably. Uh, that's easily my favorite Batman of the trilogy. That was a weird phrase I did there. Inception, I really like. <sighs> but then. On the other hand, you also make things like The Dark Knight Rises, which I can't stand. Yeah. It's like I don't just think that's the worst one; I think that's a terrible movie. So <laughs> I, I'm I'm kind of torn. And things like even things like Inception, I wonder if I watch them again. I've only watched them once. If I watch them again, would I hmm. would I be as entertained the second time round? And does that even matter, or is it something like a self-contained moment? Um, Here's the real question: Is Elliot Page a woman in that movie? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what's interesting as well, right? Um, like, I don't know how I feel about directors. There, there's certain directors, right, who just, like, you go and see a, a fucking Zack Snyder movie. You know exactly what it's going to look like. They all look the same. They've got the same, like, washed-out color scheme. There's going to be, like, a million slow-mo shots, all that sort of thing. You see a Christopher Nolan movie. It's probably going to be very, like, technically accomplished, a bit sterile, a bit, like, cold, and a bit, like, lacking in, in personality and levity and stuff. But then I miss directors like, you know, you had your Steven Spielbergs where they seem so versatile. You know, you could ha you could have a director like him who could do something like Jaws or E.T. or Schindler's List or Saving Private Ryan. Those movies are so tonally like miles apart, but all created by the same director. And I, for me, that just demonstrates a, a breadth of, um, you know, versatility that I, I just feel like you don't always get now with uh, with directors. You know, do you think that I could have know. something to do with the corporatization of the industry, though, whereby a studio isn't willing to give a large amount of money to a director unless they're doing a specific project that the studio is comfortable with them doing? It's tough to know what the thinking is behind it. I just, uh, I think, like, you know, people often try tout it as a virtue of, like, well, you know, you go and see this director, they've got a really strong artistic vision, and that shines through in every movie that they do. And I always find myself wondering, well, is that a, a, a real selling point for them, or does it just show a, a lack of versatility? Because they can literally only do the same style of movie every time, the same way. You know, you see a Taika Waititi movie, you know exactly what it's going to be like, because that's his one style that he can do. You see a Zack Snyder movie, again, you know exactly the kind of movies that he makes. They all fucking look the same. They all feel the same tonally. I don't know. I just, like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm trying to rationalize it. Um, I think for movies, it's a good thing. Like, I'm more flexible on a TV series trying, like, a wacky episode because I'm sitting at home anyway. If it's if this doesn't work, the next week you get something different. If I'm going to the effort of going all the way to the cinema, paying specifically for a movie, I want to know it's good. And so if, you're, if your style is something I like, like the John Wick movies, you know what you're going to get. I like them. Hey, when I know that, I'm going to... Tom Cruise. If he makes a Mission Impossible movie, you know what you're going to get, and you know whether you're going to like it or not before you sit down in the movie, in the theatre. And so I think that kind of standardization, standardization is good when it comes to the cinema, 
um, I don't really want to go and see like an arty film that might push the boundaries to where it's incredible or could just be trash. And you could argue that reviews and stuff would negate that um, if you were really fussy about it. Um, but I think just someone that's good and just stays there forever, even if they're doing the same kind of thing, I, I think there's an advantage to that. There's, um, yeah, there was a quote, well, the question that came up here, um, I'm just trying to bring it up. Uh, yeah, like, so am I against auteur directors and consistent vision? I guess that's not what I'm saying, but it's like, I'm kind of exploring the idea of like, is it better to, to just have a, a consistent look and feel and tone to every movie that you make? Or is it better to be versatile and be able to do a whole bunch of different genres and a different, um, you know, a whole bunch of different um styles of movie essentially but still do them to a high level of quality like i guess it was just the thing that I was interested in pondering and put into the panel and see what their thoughts were on it um, artistically speaking fan. whether yeah. <laughs> if, whether you're talking about music or movies or any kind of art i think if as an artist if you're not trying new things and you're not innovating your art will eventually become stale and repetitive and kind of crap and you see that a lot in music because a musician will develop a certain style and then they start making money with it and they never develop beyond that style. And so by the time they're in their 30s, their albums are all crap. Really common. And it happens across art. So if you want to develop and you want to remain good, you have to innovate and you have to try new things and be experimental. I, I, I think, think that's, that's true point. across the board. Like you can look at it from YouTube. There's a lot of people, like everyone who makes videos, your videos, there's like a standard point for them. Very few people innovate on every single video. because You make so many for a start, you couldn't. And, and it's one person making everything. So it's all you. If you Like a, a, one person's video it is their vision. It's their creation kind of thing. Um, editors can skew that to a, a degree. But at the end of the day, it's still what you want to create. But there are a load of channels where over time, over the years, just drop off. Because people are like, ah, this is like five years ago and they didn't really improve. So the, the better answer might be iterative improvement over time. And so you keep a sort of steady vision, but you keep moving forwards and you take what works and you carry that forwards and you leave behind what doesn't. And so it morphs over time, but it's never something completely fresh or completely new. It's just steadily getting better. Mm. Okay. Um... Asher Dales says, Random Akira Theory, it's a commentary of the post-war cultural imperialism of America upon Japan. Uh, Canada's gang is a correlation of the uh, rebel uh, uh, Bosozuku gangs of the 1950s. I mean, I'll have to take your word for that. I'm not really an expert on Akira, so I don't know, mate. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's quite interesting, the history of Japan, because if you look at the 1920s, Japan was actually Americanizing of its own free will. Baseball became very popular. Americana became very popular. People started dressing in an American style, and it was actually Americanizing of its own free will. And the militarists were very unhappy about this, and then they uh, became increasingly powerful, and they turned Japan into this insane sort of crazy Bushido kamikaze country that went insane and tried to conquer the Far East. But the Americanization wasn't necessarily the result of American cultural imperialism. It was just that MacArthur opened up Japan and made it a free market, and the Japanese chose that path for themselves. It was the same thing they were doing in the 20s. Hmm. Um, what's this one? Slack Attack says, I feel like modern creators are chasing greatness in the vein of some uh, big IP like Star Wars, and then they haven't found any passion in creating something that is unique and original. I mean, it could well be, particularly when you look at these franchises, like they might use them as a springboard, but they don't have any real new ideas to bring to the table. Um, Kyle Sanger says the new Korean show Bloodhounds looks promising. All right, nice. Uh, Casey Boyd says, when do we get a Lethal Weapon 5 review? Is this a reference to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? People were like mentioning that the other day as well. Um, one day. Um, Unhinged says, hi, Mauler. Hello. There you go. Good <laughs> good banter. Yeah. Um, Casey Boyd says, Moller, since you like Buffy, uh, what did you think of the original Charmed series? I never saw it. My sisters, uh, some of some liked slash watched it, said it was similar. I don't know if any of you guys have seen Charmed, but I never saw it. Was Alyssa Milano in it? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. I've had the misfortune of watching the entire new Charmed series <laughs> and the original uh, which is why I set through it. And is it, the is new it one, lacking in charm a little bit? Uh, the new one's one of the strangest series I've ever watched because it's like it's made by... I never looked up who made it, but it's like it's made from entirely different people every series. The first one is one of the most, um, to use the term, woke things you've ever watched. 
uh, completely destroys uh, the white lighter, literally makes him a gender studies professor professor who wears a cardigan all the time and talks about uh, women's rights need to be improved. Um, and then in the second series, because the ratings died, second series, that all goes away. And it's far more, it's, it's not like Charmed, but th they go more that route. Um, I think they got the person from uh, 12 Monkeys to come along and start making the second series. And then the third series goes straight back to how it was in the first one. It's like the guy came back and did it all over again. And they've got, uh, she becomes a lecturer in a university who uh, leads all of the students in a revolution against uh, the headmistress of this university because she wouldn't let her, like, do some, like, use one of her own really progressive books and wanted her to use the, the headmistress's own books as well. And every, every plot line is like that all the way through. Um, it, it's like, it's got split personalities. It's a bizarre, bizarre show. Hmm. Um... Casey Boyd says, I think this question got missed on Open Bar 50 because of drinkers hung over internet, probably. Uh, but I'll ask it again. Who's the best screen adapted comic character? It's got to be Iron Man, surely. Hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, I can't think of one that I liked more than him. Uh, I guess a lot of it comes down to Robert Downey Jr.'s performance, but uh, the writing for him was pretty solid. Um, yeah, I really liked him. I don't know if you guys have got a better or another option i mean if you consider it I'm, I'm not a big comic book fan i haven't really read any but in terms of jokers my favorite joker is probably jack nicholson's i mean i, I also love heath ledger and wahine phoenix but they're all great just my personal favorite in terms of comic book adaptation and sheer fun was was jack nicholson hmm. i mean there's there's a couple of you know like known one like like uh i'm seeing in chat for example a lot of people saying blade funnily enough um West Daredevil is pretty fucking awesome. Superman, mm -hmm. uh, I'm Wolverine. Dreading the new Blade. Yeah, no. Well, I'm dreading the new anything, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Iron Man is a good shout, and he's dead, and you don't need to bring him back. <laughs> <laughs> Leave they Iron will. Man alone. I mean, they'll have to feed him a steak first, but they will. Oh, he's mm -hmm. looking bad. I, I yeah. think Wolverine's I'm coming back, so. I mean, they it's figured that out with the Eternals. The, the the Eternals was a massive flop, and it was an attempt to introduce some new characters into the MCU, and it didn't work. And so they're realizing, wow, it really is all about the characters that the audience wants to see on screen, which is why you're going to have Wolverine. You'll probably get Iron Man again. Um, I mean, they've tried with, with new characters, and they failed, so. Yeah. Um, well, you've got Wolverine coming back. Hugh Jackman's going to do Deadpool 3, so yay. Yeah. Um... Kebbot says, Drinker, last week you mentioned the Monkey Island games. There's a new one called uh, Return to Monkey Island coming out. They kept the look and gameplay of the original. Might be worth a look. Cheers. That's it. We need point and click adventure games to come back. Um, I've still got fun memories of like Broken Sword and stuff like that. I love those games. Um, pretty much the, the progression was just click on everything and just hope that something happens that you can trigger. Um, Casey Boyd also says, why do Marvel and DC kill their most interesting characters? Dr. Fate, Ulysses Claw, Quicksilver, the Illuminati, etc. Can anyone explain the reasoning when Claw died? Why so late? It didn't make sense. Because, you know, he was the white guy in, in a in a Wakanda movie and he had to go. So you know. hey, At least they gave him some stuff in Andor, right? And he's not even dead in Andor. He might be in season two. <laughs> he just can't, he can't swim, but that's alright. Yeah, You can make it. Um, back then and back again says had anyone noticed that the High Inquisitor and the Smith Lady from Mando speak the same exact way are they related maybe they're the same person <gasps> never seen... the ultimate twist have we ever seen him with a hammer that's what I want to know um, alright Casey Boyd also says settle a debate in the chat how much are actors to blame for current films is it executives and directors or do we hold everyone accountable no, I don't think you hold actors accountable for the movies that they're in. They're they're just, you know, they're doing their job, and they they very unless they're very powerful actors like a Tom Cruise or something, they have next to no control over the creative decisions. Yeah, I blame the writers and the executives really. I blame Jesus. Anything. I feel like he uh, <laughs> he holds some of the responsibility here. He allowed it to happen. I only hold it's... actors responsible for the interviews because I think we saw like with Henry Cavill, like the kind of response that you can have. They ask you a question which is deliberately to bait you into attacking the fans, and he's like, no, they have a right to do that. 
So it shows that the actors still have the ability to, with what they say, and if they start following the narrative, that's entirely their fault. And their there, there's a it, comment that just like whizzed by before I could see it, before I could bring it up, but it just says most actors are quite stupid too. <laughs> I just love how blasé he was. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're you're right, they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you also have to distinguish between when actors really mean what they say and when they're just parroting what they've been told to say by the studio. So, for example, yeah. when Halle Bailey came out and she was talking about the anti or the racist backlash, blah, blah, blah. She's just parroting what she's been told to say by Disney. So mm. I wouldn't hold anything against her. She's just doing her job as she's been told to do it. So I have nothing against her. But if you get someone like... Um, and I hate to bring it up because it is a bit of a cliche, but Brie Larson, when she was um, on stage, like talking about how she doesn't want 40 year old white dudes telling her they don't like her movie, stuff like that. Like that's overboard. That's no one's asking her to say that she's doing that entirely of her own volition. And that's just spiteful. So just bear that in mind. Sometimes when when actors say nonsense, they're just doing what the studio is telling them. And sometimes they are just assholes. Does that really matter? Like what if someone think? tells you to do something horrible and you do it, aren't you responsible for your own actions? Well, it just, you are, I guess the coercion time, and stuff the... plays a part. Like when you're an actor, especially if you're just like this is your first big movie, like you you've scored a gig on a Marvel film and you're all excited and you want to like fit in with the studio and not rock the boat. There's probably a lot of pressure on you to just say what you're expected to say and not not be an asshole yeah, about it. I don't think you can really blame a 19 year old Halle Bailey for saying things about uh, racist anti backlash because she doesn't. What about when she did it voluntarily? Did there's, she? There's the uh, yeah, there was, from what I read, I think she, I can't remember the country it was in, whether it was Mexico or something, she she did an interview, um, and the guy was incredibly nice to her, and she even liked it. Uh, she was, like, thanking him for the compliments, and it was all compliments. He was like, I think you're amazing in this role, I think you've done a great thing. Um, and he did one thing where he's like, when me and my family and my daughters were there, none of us cared about, we, we know about the controversy, none of us cared about your skin colour, what we cared about um, was that we just got lost in your eyes. And she went, oh, thank you, thank you. And then the article said that she she went backstage to the executives and said, "I never want to be interviewed by unprepared journalists ever again." Um, and if if all that's true, it it doesn't come across as complimentary to me. Yeah. Um, some people pointed out Daniela Pineda for the for a Cowboy Bebop. Like, yep, that's uh, that did a lot of damage. That little impromptu video that she decided to put up. Um, yeah. That, I, I'm pretty sure that was just off her own back. So yeah, I guess that, that was going to flop anyway. I think, but it still, was... I mean, she's she's a wanker for doing that, like, like making a mistake. Yeah, it just it, it you know it created like a real atmosphere of animosity that was just stoking the fires. I guess. Um, I'll do a couple more and then finish up. Um, as his wonky eyebrow says, "Hail, good sirs. Hope all is well." Also, Mauler bad. <gasps> Sorry, Mauler, you are bad. In fact. Yeah. Because you're too long. Yeah, that's fine. JB says, Hey, Drinker, do you think there's a way to make an engaging uh, G.I. Joe movie that respects the lore while respecting all audiences? I mean, sure, yeah. Because it's like, really, it's just... It's Team America, but look, with all, without the satire elements. Like, you just want a bunch of soldier guys fighting a terrorist threat to save the world. Like, should be pretty easy to do. And you can, well... You can have a pretty diverse team as well. Like the the whole point of the GI Joe cartoon, I guess, back in the day was like you had soldiers coming from every every culture, every ethnicity, every gender. It's pretty pretty inclusive, I would say. So as long as they want to fuck Cobra, they're all right. They can join. Um, Hercules says, uh, "Hail the one uh, nine nine happy Jeremy one." Okay. <laughs> He's, uh, he's very approving of that. Uh, and Grayson Barnett says, Congratulations on 51 years of live streaming. It's been a long time, but thank you. It's 52, isn't it? Jeez. Well, this is now, yeah. Um, yeah. I started a GoFundMe for my book, Merchant of Souls, for publishing costs. It's a tragic comedy about a missing person's case gone wrong in a brothel. Well, I mean, as we all know, nothing ever goes wrong in a brothel, so yeah. I don't understand, sir. But yeah, I wish you the best of luck with that, man. Man, I uh, I hope it does well. Um, but yeah, I'll probably I'll finish it up there. I think we've done a, a whole bunch of super chats there, uh, and we've gone for about three hours or so. Uh, so, gentlemen, Disparu, Despot, um, and Jeremy, who's no longer with us, he's he's gone. He's we've lost him. But 
I want to say thanks to all you guys for coming on tonight. Um, I appreciate your time. And uh, is there anything you guys want to make us aware of? Because I've all I always say like the links to your channels are in the description. So please, for everyone who's watching, give them a follow. But is there anything you guys want to tell us about that you got coming up or anything like that? Uh, no, nothing special. Just thanks very much for having me on the show and uh, really enjoyed being here. It nice. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Oh, yeah. Thank you both. Uh, well, thank you to everyone else who's joined us tonight. Hopefully we've kept you moderately entertained for a little while. And um, thank you for all the awesome, generous super chats that you guys have sent. Um, as always, like your generosity is amazing. Uh, we really appreciate it. And the ones that we haven't done tonight, we will do on the catch-up stream on Sunday. So uh, for now, at least that is all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.